Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome to Introduction to Rhino for Architects, a little course that's done by me, Gediminas Kerdekis, and I will be your teacher for this whole course, trying to introduce you to a punishing but also a beautiful and rewarding world of creating architecture with Rhino. This course has been crafted with the assumption that you have no prior experience or knowledge of Rhino, but at the same time, I expect that you have knowledge of the most basic two-dimensional drawing and three-dimensional modeling principles, at least that. So either way, enough blah blah blah, let's jump right into it. Okay, so let's talk about Rhino. Rhino is primarily a 3D surfacing software. Surfacing is the key word, which meaning that all tools revolve around this extreme precision of curvilinear uh, surface creation, uh, manipulation, and documentation, right? So this means that and the primary user target of Rhino are product designers and vehicle designers. So you shouldn't get discouraged by this. Uh, you can always think of a building as a really, really, really slow car uh, because both have exterior envelopes, they uh, both have interior partitioning, they both have cladding, they both have um, the inner systems, assembly uh, procedures that all need to be documented somehow and explained properly through sets of drawings, right? So the benefit is that with Rhino you get an architectural modeling software that is punching way above its weight in terms of geometry manipulation and creation, right? The drawback is that it's a quite a generalized tool, meaning that design documentation capabilities of software that's focused on architectural design, such as uh, Archicad or Revit, would be much more straightforward compared to that of Rhino. Right? In this course, I will be guiding you through all of the different stages of the design process, of architectural design process, which will include design documentation. Right? And by this I mean drawing creation, just so that we're clear. So we will have plenty of time to, um, well, to talk about this some more. <laughs> right? For now, let's, let's start simple. Let's start with a UI. So as I'm recording this right now, the current version of Rhino is Rhino 7, actually. And it's this version right here that, that you see on the screen. And let me expand this. Rhino 8 is currently being worked on and I will touch upon it a little bit because there are a few distances. Now I'm switching between Rhino 8 and Rhino 7. There are a few distances with user interface between them, but the primary software on which I will explain all of the tools is going to be Rhino 7. So here with the Rhino 7, if you, if you already know, uh, let's say AutoCAD, AutoCAD would be a great great software to know in this case um, you can see that in the top we have what's called the command line and the command line is, is something that is very much used in rhino uh, when you want to go really quick with the with the tools so i can type in for instance uh, pt or point rather point and now it's running the point command for me, right? So I can place the point here, whatever, wh wherever on the screen. Um, it's the same thing, exactly the same thing as me just clicking the point icon right here and placing the point. It's just that with the command line, you don't need to go through all of the different menus, all of the different sets, every single tool, every single manipulation like tool uh, can be accessed through the command line. Right? So that's important to, to note. Another thing is this ribbon menu here in the top. You can see that currently we're in this, let's say right now, we're in the standard tab. right? And the standard tab contains all of the different um, kind of icons or tools that you would use as a, that are most commonly used, let's say, by the, by the Rhino users, such as open a new file, or create a new file, save a file, print a file, blah, 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 all, all of these. I will not be going through them um, exclusively right now. We will cover them once we get into the tools category of this course, but just to kind of keep it simple, 
um, you have the, this ribbon menu where you have different subcategories of different tools. And right now I'm only talking about the horizontal portion. I will cover the vertical portion in just a second. So we have the standard tab that is the most used tools, contains the most used tools. We have the seaplanes tab, which basically contains the orientation, all of the ways of how you can manipulate the orientation on which you are drawing or, or the orientation of your model. Then we have the view tab, which controls, of course, the camera, the camera positioning. Uh, the display tab, which changes uh, in which you have all of the options to change the way the geometry is displayed, previewed. Selection tab, um, you can select different types of geometries with this, this one. And also you can, for instance, undo the previous selection. So if you've selected something and uh, accidentally unselected it, you can reselect it by clicking this little button right here. Actually a very useful button. Again, we'll cover that in a bit. Uh, viewport layout, um, that is just, you know, what kind of a different type of a viewport layout do you want? Do you want to have one single screen, maybe four screens, maybe three screens, you name it, you can choose, right? Then we have visibility, hiding and unhiding, uh, different types, of, uh, different geometries within your document. You have transform tab, which is basically moving things, uh, scaling things, making things bigger or smaller, uh, copying things, right? So everything that is handled like that is handled by this little tab and these, these, all of these tools right here, curve tools. Uh, well, it says it itself, everything that has to do with lines and curves, uh, surface tools, everything that has to do with surfaces, uh, single thickness surfaces, mind you, important to note, right? So no, no volume, just a single, or like surfaces that don't have any Z thickness. Solid tools, which has Z thickness, you know, like um, volumes that are enclosed. Sub D tools, and this is a new type of geometry that was introduced in Rhino 7 and that I am a very big fan of. And we will be covering what sub D is in future, uh, how do I say chapters, chapters, future chapters of this, um, of this course, but basically sub D tools and solid tools are quite similar in their way, but also sub D tools are quite similar to mesh tools. Meshes are something, are, are pieces of geometry that are made from triangles and quads. Um, I assume most of you know what meshes are. If you don't, I strongly suggest just typing in mesh geometry and quickly in, in Google and quickly reading about it. It's quite easy to, to comprehend. It's just basically a mesh is the simplest form of 3D geometry representation through sets of triangles or rectangles or both. There are also n-gons, but we're not going into that territory. So mesh tools, you know, like simple geometry manipulation. In architecture, by the way, we almost never use meshes. So uh, this is only going to be useful if you're planning on 3D printing things and so on. Then we have rendering tools. We don't render in Rhino ever. No bad idea unless you have like a plugin such as uh, V-Ray for Rhino, that, that's a pretty good one. Uh, then of course you can render, but the default render engine as it is right now is too weak to produce proper architectural renders and also too unstable. So ignore this tab, this tab doesn't exist. Drafting, measurements, line types, line weights, everything, text, um, everything you need in terms of drafting is going to be located here. What's new in version seven, that's, I guess, pretty nice, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's pretty much self-explanatory. And I have two more tabs here that you probably don't have D5 converter that is for exporting the scene into a D5 render, by the way, free render engine. That's that works really great. Uh, check it out. Uh, and section tools, right? So section tools is a plugin for Rhino that helps you create 
um, custom, not custom, but automate the section process of uh, architectural designs. Uh, I might cover section tools a little bit later in this course. So those are the tabs that we have here in the top ribbon. Uh, then we have uh, this little, oh, sorry, one more thing that almost forgot, <laughs> almost forgot to mention. These tabs, as I'm switching be uh, through them, notice how most of the time uh, these tools on the left hand side, they stay the same, right? But immediately as I jump to solid tools, surface tools, curve tools, these start changing to a different type of a um, tool set. So you can think about these tabs in the way that um, you're changing modes of how you work with, Rev uh, with Rhino uh, through changing these tabs, right? So as you change to solid tools, you're, it's as if you're saying to Rhino, I'm now going to work with solids. So please present me in the horizontal menu as well as in the vertical menu. Please present me with all of the tools that we have that deal with solids. Hope that makes sense. So we have that. So this is interactive as well. Uh, for now, I'll stay in the standard tab just to kind of finish up explaining the user interface. Um, on the left hand side in the top, uh, I have something that you also probably don't. This is uh, from a plugin that's called V-Ray for Rhino. It's a 3D rendering engine for, well, not just for Rhino, for 3ds Max, like it's it's out there. It's There's also V-Ray for Revit, I believe. Um, I just use it for architectural visualization. It's fine, but uh, we I will not be covering this, uh, this portion in this video. Then I'm skipping, or actually I'm not gonna skip uh, now, I'm going to actually uh, show you the viewports. So these are called the viewports and we have four of them. If you want to maximize either one of the viewports, because by default we have perspective view, top view, front view, and right view, right? You can zoom in and out in them with your scroll wheel. You can, in the perspective view, if you want to rotate, you just right click, click and drag, right click and drag. So you rotate around, zoom in, zoom out. If you hold down the shift key, shift, and right click, right click and drag, you're panning the view. If you're just uh, in the, so this only works in perspective view. In orthographic view, to pan the view, you just right click and drag and holding down the shift key and right clicking will not do anything. You, you are still panning the view. That is because you can't rotate a projection based view such as top or front, right? It's impossible to rotate it. Uh, so those are the viewports. If you want to, if they are too small, let's say you're working on a, well, most of the time you're actually working in one of the viewports, not four of them at the same time. So if uh, they are too small, you just double click on the name of the viewport that you want to enlarge. Double click. And then it makes, you know, the, that viewport full, full screen, right? You're working, you're modeling, blah, blah, blah. And then you want to jump back and look at the, let's see the top view you double click the name of the viewport again, in this case, perspective, and you're back in your top, let's say the top view or the front view. And you can kind of jump between the viewports this way by just double clicking their names. Okay, hope that helps out, hope that makes sense. Then we have the view, uh, or not the view, prop. we have the all of the tabs here on the right hand side. Right. So to explain what these do, I actually kind of want to have a, at least one piece of geometry inside of uh, my Rhino file. So I'm just going to create, let's create a point. So a point is created. Make sure that you're in standard tab and click the point object right here, single point right here. Or you can alternatively just type in point, enter and just click anywhere on the viewport. Doesn't matter in which viewport you're creating it. Click anywhere. And you just kind of place a point right here. So 
if you don't have anything selected so the point is placed right uh, but just don't make sure that it's not selected so click anywhere else on the screen so that nothing is selected if you don't have anything selected on the right hand side you will have these tabs that are properties tab if you hover over them it's going to tell you what these are properties tab layers tab rendering tab again we don't do rendering here materials tab we sometimes play with materials that's fine libraries tab so materials that rhino has baked in into rhino help tab help is actually very useful i'll talk about it in just a second display tab you probably don't see this i will show you how you can see this and notifications tab so you have these uh, if you don't see display tab or if you want to have more tabs right here you can always click this uh, wheel uh, gear is it a gear gear icon right here which will open up uh, like this drop down list of different types of tabs that you can um, just place in or, or tick mark in this case so for instance i can tick mark my I don't know, uh, sun tab. So a tab that controls the sun. So in, in, in that regard, you can enable your display tab to be there so that you have exactly the same tabs as I do. Let me actually get rid of the sun tab because it's just in the way. If I need it, I will just type in sun, <laughs> like the tool here, sun. Anyway. If you don't have anything selected and you're in the uh, let's talk about properties if you don't have anything selected and you're in the properties tab then the settings that you will get are going to be the settings of the viewport itself so here you can see that it's a perspective viewport this is the size of the viewport i believe if i yeah if i expand this the size changes to be bigger it, uh, it's basically right now giving you a perspective type of projection. You can change it to parallel to make it axonometric or orthographic, if you wish, or isometric, isometric, right? To make it isometric, but I prefer to model with a perspective view. It distorts a little bit less and you, even though you, it's harder to tell which lines are parallel and which ones are not, but it gives you a better feel and understanding of the forms that you're creating. Then we have the lens length here. So the lens length basically controls um, the distortion, right? The distortion of the lens. So if I were to, actually we'll talk about the lens length later. Just uh, know that the larger the number here, the more axonometric let's say 150 the more axonometric the view will become the smaller the number you can kind of see it by the grid right the smaller the number let's say 10 the more sharp and the more mm, fish eye of a lens you're going to have right so it's going to be wonky uh the default is 50 i think 50 works really great for modeling sometimes i change this to 70 uh, when i need it to be a little bit more axonometric rotation uh, never mess around with the rotation unless you want to have a very bad time <laughs> 3d modeling so keep the rotation please keep it as it is keep it at zero um, we have the XYZ location, that's the location of the camera, the current location of the camera, and this is the distance at around which the camera is rotating, right? So you can technically place the camera wherever you want, right? Um, and it's just going to be, yeah, going to be placed there, whatever. Um, you can also mess around with the target location uh, right here. So what the camera is looking at, uh, so you can place the target you know, right onto this point, for instance. Um, then we have wallpaper. Uh, we just say that it's, oops, sorry. Uh, we just say that it's uh, untouchable and you should not mess around with it because it's, um, you can really kind of mess up your, your viewport if you start playing around with the wallpaper. It's a backdrop. It's whatever you have in the back. Keep it empty. Keep it clean. All right. If... I select the point, 
I just click it or I can drag around it. If I select the point, then I get the properties of the point, right? So it changes from the properties of the view to the properties of the point. So here I can see, one second, I need some coffee. Okay, we're good. So here I can see that the type of my geometry that I have selected is the point. It doesn't have a name, but I can give it a name, uh, Bob. Sure. My point right here is Bob. The layer in which it's created is the just black colored layer default. Uh, its display color is inherited by uh, the layer. Its line type, if it's a curve, would be inherited by the layer. So you control it through the layer properties. Print color by layer, print width by layer. This is exactly how I want it. I want to control everything uh, for printing out through layer properties, not through individual object properties, right? Then um, if this was a three-dimensional object, you could um, adjust how precise, how accurate the preview of that object is right here. Since it's a single point, uh, this setting is grayed out. Would you like it to cast shadows? Yes or no? Would you like it to receive shadows? Yes or no? It's a point. It won't do any one of these things, but it's good to have, um, you know, for, for more uh, advanced geometry, it's good to have this, this option here. Um, in terms of ISO curve density, uh, I will show it to you once we start creating surfaces. It's basically how many... Um, lines on top of the surface do you show to showcase the curvature of said surface. If you want to match the properties to some other object, let's say one, one object is red and this object is black and you want to make this object black uh, red as well, then you can match, click the match um, and select that object to which you want to match the properties of this one. We usually don't do that since we're controlling everything through layers. So we control the properties of the object by just moving them to their respected layers, which brings us to layers, the, the, the la layers menu or layers tab, I should say. So in here, uh, it works in very, very similar way as AutoCAD does, right? We have, um, a way of how we can create a new layer and let me create one and I, I'll call this uh, big Bob big Bob layer right and let's make one more uh, small Bob or small Tim small Tim right we have big Bob and small Tim we have two layers created here and we have options for them before i do uh, before i mess around with the options understand that there is a possibility to create hierarchy for these two layers so if i want big bob to be like the main layer and i want small tim to be a part of the big bob group i can just take this layer and drag it into um, the big bob right so now the small Tim layer can be, and it's stupid, it's stupid naming convention. Why am I doing this? Let me create a new one and let's call it window, window layer. And I'll create one more and call it uh, frames. So window frames and one more layer and call it glass, right? So I can take frames and put it in the window layer and I can take glass and put it in the window layer. And now I have the main layer that's, set, that's called window and it contains two sub layers that are called frames and glass. And let's say the frames layer also has a sub layer. By the way, you, can, you don't need to really drag it. You can always click this new sub layer icon right here that creates a sub layer within the frames layer called, um, let's say screws, right? And 
let's say within this another sub layer that's called uh, aluminum profiles aluminum aluminum i don't know um so screws and profiles right so we can see that now everything lives inside of this window layer expand it there's the frames and the class and i expand the frames inside of the frames layer i have screws and aluminum profiles in doing so i can um how do you explain this i in doing so i can control i can control perfectly what um which geometry is where i can show and hide different parts of the window very easily with this uh, uh, whatever you call it the light bulb with this light bulb icon i can lock let's say i want to lock only the screws so i'm i can't select them in my viewport so i can lock them by doing so and i can color things differently so the hierarchy is very useful when working with Rhino and uh, we will be using it quite a bit in the future chapters of this course. So let me delete that and let's just create two layers. One, two. Uh, first one is going to be called red. Second one is going to be called blue. And I'll make one more point right here. Single point. Bam like that so i have two points so first of all i want to color my layers right i want to color the red layer uh red so i will just click on this black rectangle right here and i'll choose the red color or you can choose it from here hit ok and now it's red i'll do the same thing for the blue one blue click and it's blue now we can see that since uh, for some reason I, uh, this was my active layer, so let me fix that. Um, so to be able to move a point into either one of these layers, I need to select the point that I'm going to be moving like that. Right click on the layer, let's say red. I right click on it and I choose change object layer. And now it lives inside of this red layer. Uh, for blue, I do exactly the same thing. I select the other point, right click on the blue layer, change object layer, and now it's inside of the blue layer. Right? So I can hide and preview that those specific layers. I can lock them. If I lock the red layer and I drag around both of these points, only the blue point will be selected because the red one is locked. I can't select it, right? If both of them are locked, I can't, I can't select either one of them. Like that. Now I can select both, right? So I can hide, I can unhide, I can lock, unlock, I can change their color. Uh, I can also change the material of them, but we're going to skip over this because it, rendering, again, bad, we don't do it. Um, instead, Let's talk about line types, or actually, with points, I can't really show you the line types, and we still haven't talked about different types of geometry that you can create. So this would be kind of skipping ahead. Let's, let's just say that you can control if it's a dashed line, or a solid line, or a double line. Uh, well, maybe not a double line, but a thick line. With the line types, you can control how what's the color of it being printed out, should it be printed out as red and blue or should it be printed out as black and what's the thickness of it being printed out so print with those are the settings okay I'll, I'll skip ahead because we don't want to deal with that right now um you can delete the layers you can move layers up to um reshuffle them or not reshuffle that restructure them i guess uh, you can, if, if you have, if, if let's say you accidentally drag the red layer inside of the blue, blue layer, right? And you don't want to have that hierarchy. You can always select the red layer and click this, uh, wait, yes. Click that red uh, icon right here. And that is going to kind of collapse the family back into s separate individual layers. There's also ways to filter out the layers. Um, 
to to select all of the locked ones or all of the unlocked ones and so on but uh, we will not be dealing with that right now um i don't remember the tools i never used the tools there is nothing that useful inside of the tools no we will not talk about that that would take too long and it's not that useful okay um then i guess that's it these two tabs are the most important ones on the right hand side everything else is very niche and we will talk about the remainder of the right hand side once we actually need need it because it's so yeah it's so niche Ooh, slowly slowly moving through it okay so now in the back uh, back portion or lower portion of the viewport you will notice this xyz icon right here so the xyz icon shows the orientation of your camera or the actual the angle at which the camera is moving or looking at the world um, this really helps you understand if you are upside down or not because for new users you you will end up being upside down more often than you think so if z is looking down just tilt the camera so that z is looking up besides that that's just a nice way of orienting yourself right uh, you can also look at the grid here the green um, axis right here always is the axis that is looking uh, towards the Z direction. The red axis is always looking towards X. It repeats for every single view, but please note that in the top view, top view and perspe perspective view by default match up in directions, while the front view, you can see that the grid is um, tilted right because we're looking at things from the side right so it should be flat but it's not it's actually tilting and we're looking at still at the plan projection of it um so now the green axis is z and not y right it says so here <clears throat> so keep that in mind uh what else oh yeah and in the right view it's z and y not this is at an x this is at an y all right so then in the bottom here um you probably you might not have any of these um bottom buttons selected so i'll quickly guide you through them and explain you uh, explain to you what they do so first of all um let's go to perspective view um this is your coordinate system and basically where your mouse is within said coordinate system so let's go back to perspective and let me move my mouse very close to where 000 is notice how the coordinates are very very small right in the bottom left right here they are small when i have my mouse right here the more I move along the X axis, the larger the X number is getting, but the Y is not increasing. But if I were to move it now along the Y axis, the Y is increasing, right? So it basically just shows you the position of my of the mouse. Um, even if you have it rotated like so, and you have your mouse somewhere here, it's going to project the mouse straight downwards. Uh, onto the grid so it's it kind of is ge guessing where you expect the mouse to be and also it's it kind of shows you where a geometry is going to be created if you decide to you know just start drawing let's say from here um and that is zero right because it's snapping to the ground uh, then we have what's your units in which you model. Right now we're modeling in millimeters. If you want to change your units, you can by just typing in units. This menu will pop up. Units. This menu will pop up where you can change your model units from millimeters to whatever you want. Um, parsecs or light years, for instance. 
Why not? The world's your oyster. <laughs> Please don't. Um, so millimeters is fine. Absolute tolerance 0.01 units. Anything lower than this, anything lower than 0.001 millimeters is going to be considered the same within the same um, partition of the world. So this is basically how accurate you're going. And I would argue that you don't need to be more accurate than this when creating architecture. Angle tolerance, one degrees, um, or sorry, not one, 1 1.0, that's important. Um, that means anything that is lower than one, let's say if it's 1.01 .01 degrees of misalignment is going to snap back to 1.0 that is good that is fine that works for us then display precision uh, this is how accurately the screen displays your model uh, three digits after the comma is excellent and we use it we stay with it it's okay so just note model units millimeters um, you can change to any type of unit you want we stay with millimeters though um, this is the layer, the current layer that you're using, your active layer. Oh, I forgot to mention. Under layers, if you want to change your active layer to be something else, you just double click on that layer. Right, like that. You just double click on the layer and it changes. Or alternatively, you can click here and change it to red, default, or blue from here then we have different snapping options and different kind of just toggles here in the bottom of the line grid snap basically um yeah so with grid snap turned on if i were to create one more point and zoom in to the grid you can see that it's snapping to the grid cells right here Right, so I can't create a point anywhere else than on the grid. I hate it. Absolutely, some people like it. I absolutely hate it. This is a recipe for disaster because the grid snaps to one millimeter increments, meaning, and it sometimes overwrites the, let's say, endpoint to endpoint snap, meaning that it's a recipe for disaster when things are just misaligned by. 0 0.1 millimeters or sorry uh, 0.1 1 millimeter right it's not good uh, for architecture don't do it just don't grid snap have it off all the time and make sure that it's off orthographic snap um this is basically just forces all of the geometry right now i'm not going to show it to you because we need to first cover the geometry uh, creation uh, for me to show it to you but orthographic snap basically shows you um, or, or aligns the geometry to 90 degree increments or if you want to you can change the increments to be if I right click on this set ortho angle I can set it to 45 degrees as I have it uh, right now so if, if you change the ortho angle or sorry if ortho is on and you have it set to 90 degrees and by default it is 90 degrees then please don't repeat this i will just show it a single line uh, that is created is going to be drawn either horizontally or vertically no in-betweens if i change this to 45 degrees then it's zero 45, 90, 135, 180, 215, you get the idea, right? Um, so let's ch change this back to 90. Um, I always, when, when you do something, it's going to start asking you, Rhino always likes to ask you questions in the command line, so always keep an eye out for what is it asking of you in the command line? Uh, so ortho is nice. Planner uh, basically makes sure that everything that you draw is going to be flat. 
that is useful and we will cover why that's useful in later chapters but just know that it's a it's a tool that is here uh, object snap uh, or o snap as i like to call it basically it makes it so that it becomes possible to snap to different types of objects or different areas within objects so middle of the line for instance or endpoints of a line or geometry uh, you can snap to and you can start precisely drawing from them with object snap smart track uh, some people like it some people don't i'm amongst those people who don't really like smart track it's it basically tries to catch the directions which which you use in rhino as you're drawing some sort of a let's say like that and then something like that and then oops one second so you see that gray line that's smart track it basically uh, suggests that if you stop right here like so these lines and and, and then connect these two lines there is going to be a 90 degree angle you know be between this line and this line and this line and this line that's what smart track does it not it doesn't just do that it does a little bit more with parallel lines and so on but most of the time it's for me it's just annoying because it tries too hard to please me and it tries too hard to kind of suggest things that i personally don't want it to suggest so once you have very complex geometry it gets a little bit overbearing and a little bit um, annoying so i usually have smart track turned off but um, try it out maybe it's for you because i know that many people like to have it turned on gumball my favorite little thing so with gumball uh, let's just go back to perspective view and select one of the points or rather let's create a box let's be let's be brave let's create a box so let's go to default um layer let's make this our active layer so that our box is black and not red or blue and here in the left hand side on the left hand side just click on the box icon right here or just type in box and remember then you need to read what it asks of you in the command line so it asks you to give it the first corner of the box. You can either type in the first corner, uh, the coordinates of it, or you can just click anywhere, you know, where you want to draw the box from. So let's say from here. And we're slowly drawing the box, right? It asks you to give it other corner or base or length. So there are different ways uh, for us to... Um, create the box in this case let's do the simplest one and let's just click again somewhere on the screen to create the to basically give it a second corner point for the base of the box and then it asks you for the height where you can either just type in the height or just click the third time to create to finish creating the box like that right Congratulations, you have your first box. You can't really see it. I mean, you can see the wireframe of it, but you can't see the shaded view of it. And that is because the current view uh, property that is set is set to be um, wireframe. You can quickly change this by going to perspective, right clicking on perspective view and choosing shaded right here. Congratulations, now it's shaded. You can also go for rendered. It's well, I, I think your rendered is not going to be like my rendered. I should probably doesn't matter. Uh, Arctic is nice, just so you know. Probably I also messed up the Arctic uh, preset, um, so mine might not be <laughs> the same as yours. I apologize, but just play around with these. <clears throat> the, the most useful ones are wireframe, shaded um arctic and sometimes ghosted because ghosted shows you the back edges here um i also have previews such as this well it looks really bad with the 
with a single box but just trust me they, they look pretty nice once you have pretty complex geometry so just know that you can customize this quite heavily um where were we oh yeah the gumball so as i if my i have gumball disabled and i just select the box there's no way for me to move it except i can type in move right and then i can move it from point to point right move again from point to point that's bad if i have gumball turned on and i select the box now i have this little cool little widget icon here that i can use to move the box along the axes the different axes x y z i can also rotate the box around x around z around y and i can also scale the box so notice what i'm doing right uh, the arcs rotate, the arrows move, and these little um, rectangular doodads here, they scale. If I want to scale the box uh, uniformly in all the directions uh, at the same time, I can hold the shift key while I'm dragging. You might say that, well, this is not accurate because you don't know by how much you're moving, by how much you're scaling, by how much you're rotating. And this is true. If you're just using your mouse, it's not accurate. But if you press and just click on the arrow, then you can type in in millimeters 50. Enter. And then the box moves exactly by 50 millimeters. You can type in, you can click on an arc and type in 90. And the box rotates by 90 degrees you can shift click the scale do that here and type in two and the box is scaled by 200 percent in all directions or you can just um, scale it in, in in one direction by two if, if you don't hold the shift key um so gumball is super useful in that regard and Trans translation, positioning, and rotation. By the way, if you want to mirror something, uh, you, scale, uh, you scale the thing by minus one in a certain... Um, let me actually show you. Oh, uh, before I do, to copy an object, you can also use a gumball to copy an object. If you hold down the Alt key, Alt, A-L-T, Alt key, and you drag it by the gumball, uh, along any one of the directions and release the alt key and release the mouse it's going to make a copy right so that's pretty neat and then um, same thing goes with scaling and so on you can make copies by just holding the alt key to mirror a thing to make it a mirrored version of the thing you just scale it along a direction in which you want to mirror or per perpendicular to a mirror plane you just scale it by negative one and then you get a mirrored version so that's that's pretty neat i think that's pretty nice because you can get uh, pretty cool uh, results with very simple operations right so that's, uh, that's Gumball. There are more advanced techniques to Gumball, such as if I right click on the Gumball uh, icon here, you can see that there are all of these different settings that we can change. So for instance, I can, al right now the Gumball is al aligned to C plane and this is the C plane, this is the, the thing. So you can see that the X is uh, the same X as what we uh, see here the y is the same y and the z is the same z and after i've rotated the the box um, they don't really match up that well with the directions of the box so it, if i want to fix this if i want the x to align with the you know with any one direction of the box and the x and y and z all of them to be aligned i right click on the gumball and i choose align to object align to object and now you can see that 
x goes across the box, y goes along the box, and z goes here. So I can, again, yet again, I can scale the box any way I want. I can rotate it <clears throat> around these axes, right? And as long as the, how do you call it? As long as the gumball alignment is set to align to object, it's going to be, it's going to follow the box, right? Um, align to seaplane and align to world in this case are the same, um, exactly the same thing because the seaplane and the world, since we didn't mess with the seaplane, which is this grid right here, uh, the seaplane and the world are exactly the same thing. Uh, align to view is very weird. It always aligns your uh, gumball, the Z uh, rotation of the gumball to your view. So you can kind of move it in the view. I have no idea why you would use this. This is very trippy. Align to object or align to seaplane are the two ones that I use. There's also smooth dragging and snappy dragging. We will talk about this later. It's just snappy dragging snaps to different portions of the geometry. Right, so you can kind of, while you're dragging, it's also snapping. Most of the time, you just use smooth dragging. Um, that's it. We will not mess around with these, uh, with these settings. So let's go back to align to seaplane, like that. And let's just ignore record history, because th this is a recipe for disaster for beginner users. Let's just say you can make Rhino remember what's the geometry which was used to create a certain type of a surface or a certain type of a wall with window openings. And then as you move the initial geometry, the final geometry updates a very like it's it's hierarchical it's parametric and very very you can break it very easily so let's let's not let's just not let's not maybe later maybe later in a year or so maybe two so let's skip ahead filter uh if you enable the filter here you can see um all of the tick marks here and you can choose what kind of geometry you don't want to get access to in terms of selecting it so if i untick points now i am unable to select the points even though my uh, layers are enabled right if they're not locked i still can't select the points this is useful when you have way too much geometry in your scene but other than that usually you want to have i now tick mark the points by the way uh, other than that you always want to have all of the selections possible for you or else you're gonna be confused so i have that enabled and don't mess with the filter Minutes from last save, 65 minutes, memory use, 708 megabytes, uh, available memory, 40 gigabytes, whatever. So this is just um, statistics uh, that are kind of looping, reminding you for what you've done. Um, last saved is something that keeps teasing me every time when Rhino crashes. I This kind of loops around and tells me when was the last time I saved, so that's that's always a nice nice thing to see um in terms of saving you just file save as and you just save the file wherever you want on your computer right that's as easy as it gets okay let's see um i believe that is it in terms of the user interface that i wanted to showcase um one second yes these are oh yeah and the final one is right here you can also if you don't want to toggle out and jump back into top view back to perspective view in you know if you don't want to keep jumping between these um, by minimizing and maximizing different views you can stay in one maximized view and just jump between the tabs right here perspective top front right so you have your little cards here as well available for you all right 
that is it with the user interface and finally finally we can jump in and start actually make not making stuff but ex uh, i finally can explain to you the different tools and different ways of creating geometry that we have available i almost forgot i almost forgot we have rhino 8 in the works it's currently not released it's still a very let's say dirty work in progress um i believe it's going to be released sometime late 2023 maybe early 2024 but i will you know just because this course is probably going to stay for longer than one year uh, up for longer than one year i should cover what's new in rhino um eight in terms of user interface so one thing that you will note immediately notice immediately is that all of your tabs on the right hand side all of the tabs are right here right they're not uh, in the top anymore they're right here so you can access the properties layers and so on by just going through them uh, in, in a vertical order seems like it's a pretty minuscule change but it's really not I mean um, you really need to uh, retrain your muscle memory to be able to access them um, there's also these uh, four dotted um, docking uh, whatever bars or whatever you call them uh, that you can that you can use to redock different portions of the viewport to different parts of, of come on come on like that different parts of uh rhino right so you can reshuffle you can you could do the same thing in rhino 7 but right right now with rhino 8 it seems like it's even more customized it can be even more customized customized with these three or four dotted um uh, areas or uh, tabs that you can that you can take other than that um it's pretty uh, same it's it's pretty much the same thing um basically what i've read in the forums what they tried to do is they tried to <clears throat> bring rhino um rhino for mac and rhino for windows the user interfaces of both of them into the same cohesive whole because right now as it is in rhino 7 rhino for mac and rhino for windows they have two different interfaces so it gets a little bit messy when trying to kind of understand what the hell is going on between uh, between them right um in this case uh, they they kind of start sharing the same um user experience especially with the tabs here on the right hand side the command line at least stays so that's great to see i just wanted to point it out before we move on to our next chapter that is that is geometry creation okay so let's start by uh, talking about what kind of geometry types are there or rather let's create a system on how i'm going to teach you creating geometry in rhino so i think the best way to think about geometry uh, as we're starting up is through dimensions so let's say um an object that has zero dimensions is a point right it doesn't have any length width or height it is just a singular you know point in space and there are two ways of how you can create points well more than two but the two most basic ones are if you just type in point you can just place it anywhere or you can also type in point and type in the coordinates um so by the way the to repeat um command or any kind of tool that you already used you can just hit enter or use the right mouse button right mouse button if you just click it it works in the exact same way as what enter on your keyboard does so if i just hit enter it repeats the point command right here and it asks me to give it a location and then i can instead of clicking with my mouse somewhere on the screen i can just type in uh let's say 
zero comma a hundred comma zero enter and it's just going to place a point that is on x axis is at it's at zero on y axis it's at 100 and on z axis is at it's at zero so there's no height i can make another one zero comma 100 comma uh, 100 and now i have a point above the second one the third point is 100 units or 100 millimeters above it right because its coordinates are 0 100 100 so that's uh, how you can create points either by clicking the scroll or the mouse button the right uh, left mouse button or by typing in the coordinates if you wish to create more than one point well technically you could just kind of keep right click place right click place right click place so by right clicking i'm repeating the command right so technically you could do it this way but a much faster way is just to type in points not point but points command that is also located right here points oh i should probably mention this right um every tool not every but most of the tools i by the way hit escape to cancel the command um every tool that you see here it has this small little triangle at the bottom if you click the triangle that tool set will expand to unve unveil uh, more kind of sub tools or tools that go together with this so for instance for the point tool there is a single point creation multiple point creation but you can also extract points from a surface or get the closest point to a certain type of geometry from a specific area or spe specific position and so on right so there are a lot of sub tools i will be kind of showing you the the tools that are most used in architectural design so we will not be covering 100 percent of all of the tools in rhino because this would be uh, a few years long course at this point uh, so let's uh, let's continue. So if I want to create multiple points, I can either choose this uh, icon right here, or just type in points, and then I just keep clicking, you know, as much as I want in creating the points wherever I want them. And once I'm done, I just hit enter, and they're all here. And now I have a lot of points. So I'm just going to select all of them and hit delete. To get rid of them so that they're not in the way that's it that's all we need to know about zero dimensional objects right now one dimensional objects lines curves ellipses arcs i guess a circle a circle can be considered to be a surface as well but let's call it a one dimensional object a non-filled in circle uh, yeah that that's gonna do it so a line the easiest way to draw a line well you type in the line tool or you can expand your polyline uh, menu let's say right here and you can choose the first uh, icon here line i prefer to use the command line so i will be using that line enter from a certain point or a coordinate if you want to you know so you can just like for a point you can type in the coordinate or just specify with your mouse from here click to here click we get a line easy right so it just draws a straight line not much to it for a polyline to create a polyline well it's this main tool right here or you type in pl i believe no pl is plain sorry polyline okay sure you need to type in polyline hit enter it basically just asks you to give it multiple points and it's just going to draw you know a polyline through them um in terms of the mode of drawing so now right now i'm still in the polyline creation mode uh tool uh as we're drawing uh, you can change the mode from line to arc, just like in AutoCAD. And then you can start drawing with arcs, your, your polyline. No, something like that. 
and then if you want to stop drawing with arcs you can always click again on the mode right here and just finish it up here you can see that there's more options here but we're not going to go through them uh, just note that there are usually many options for every single tool uh, so it goes really like the software goes really really deep i just don't want you to get overwhelmed so we're going to keep it as simple as possible we have ourselves a bunch of arcs and like a single polyline yay curve okay uh, so there are two types of curves that i want to cover uh, what's the difference between a polyline that's made out of arcs and a curve? If I were to, let, let's do this again. Polyline from here, mode, arc, and just kind of pump, 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 pump. Uh, sure, pump, pump. One second, I want it to be pretty. Eh, okay, the end is not nice, but sure. You know so we have something like this and then i can choose this control point curve tool right here and i can kind of you know let, let, let's just draw i'm drawing it like i would draw a polyline like that click here right to end it so i have my nerves curve this is called by the way the nerves curve and i have my polyline if i were to select this polyline i and type in explode i would get 13 segments so i'm exploding this curve into its pieces like 13 different segments of it right and so on if i were to select this nerves curve and explode it cannot explode a single curve into segments this is continuous it doesn't have parts it's a single thing and this is the main difference between um, let's say what you would expect to see in autocad unless you're drawing with splines which is a little bit of pain uh, pain in the ass to draw in splines with autocad uh, compared to what you draw with in Rhino and this is why Rhino is quite powerful because after I have drew this and I select the object you can still see the, uh, the control points of this curve and I can adjust the control points as I please it's always going to be perfectly smooth there is never going to be any kinks even if I purposely try to make it uh, messed up like that it's still going to have a certain area of continuity it's never going to have a sharp corner so it's continuous right that's the main difference <clears throat> sorry um, how is it created so I, I always show this example to my other students um, how are these nerves curves created? Well, you can think of it this way. If I, oops, if I were to have like a zigzag here of a polyline, right? And then I apply, let's create a new layer, uh, red. I deleted the layers previously. So red layer. Um, and within that layer, I'll draw another one. But this time I will go to my object snap i know i didn't explain the snapping yet so at this point you will need to trust me go to here in the bottom or snap o snap and turn on endpoint snapping and midpoint snapping these two tick marks have to be ticked end and mid this will enable you to snap to the end points of the line segments as well as the middle of the line segments and by doing so i can do endpoint midpoint then midpoint if i remember correctly midpoint is it sorry give me a second midpoint here and then point here i believe this is correct yeah this this should be correct uh, so this is like one iteration of me 
just uh, kind of partitioning or dividing up the the the, the, the curve you know this polyline curve into kind of more smoothed out version of it i can do this again end point midpoint mid 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 and this gives me one more iteration of this and again i can do this one more time mid 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 gives me this version and so on so as i'm as i'm going through this and this was a bad example because the control points are so far far apart but as i'm going through this this is moving out slowly and if we were to look at how a curve will would look going through this you know it kind of eventually smooths out to something like this Oops, that, that one messed up. Give me a second. There we go. It smooths out to something like this. So infinite amount of smoothing steps would give us this kind of a result. I believe I made a mistake with the midpoint uh, at some part of this, uh, not script, um, procedure. Let's call it procedure. I believe I made a small mistake, but just know that playing with endpoints and midpoints and reiterating the polyline infinite amount of times through its own midpoints and endpoints will give you a perfectly smooth curve that's how it basically works but then i hear you saying well this is not accurate enough for me to create architecture because now i the, the curve that I'm drawing will never reach the points that I'm specifying, right? As I'm drawing it. Fear not. There is a second tool that does exactly that. So if we were to expand the curve um, tool set, the second tool right here is curve interpolate points. This one right here. And or interp curve, by the way, interp CRV command which basically forces so let's say start here 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 and here you can see that it forces a curve to go through the points that you specify by creating control points way outside right so that's that's how this one works right so interp curve uh, might be useful in more cases than the regular curve but i personally prefer using the regular curve um, it's matter of preference at this point then we have circle well a circle is just a circle right here right circle center radius so if i select a circle or type in a circle doesn't matter it asks me to give it a center point and i can type in a radius 100 millimeters enter and now I have a circle that, you know, has a radius of 100 millimeters. You can also, instead of a radius, you can use, um, sorry, instead of a radius, uh, you can use a circle diameter, which is the second tool right here, or you can create a circle from three points. You would be surprised how often it's useful, actually, to just, let's say I have one, two, three points, make sure that your... Um, point snap is turned on yeah there it is so object snap is enabled and point snap in the bottom here is turned on and then we have these three points and i create a circle uh through sorry through these three points circle three points click 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 and i get a circle that fits perfectly on these three points quite a useful tool honestly all right enough with the circles ellipses ellipse is literally you create it in exactly the same way as you create a circle so you can create ellipse from center point or ellipse from a diameter let's just make a simple one ellipse from center point asks you to give it two radii and that's it center point radius one radius two you have an ellipse congratulations I never use ellipses. <laughs> uh, then we have an arc. So this tool right here, arc, it creates, um, 
so so you give it uh, you always give the center point first in most of the tools that are circular you give the center point first and then you specify where the start of the arc is and where the end of the arc is or you can give it an angle 45 degrees or other way around minus 45 degrees enter and this arc is 45 degrees in its angle look the for instance the opening angle of the door if i were to draw a line uh, let's say um, ortho snap please ortho snap let's say i have a door that's opened up and that is 900 millimeters in its length in a plan you know this single line and i want to make an arc showing it's the door swing i just create an arc from the center point from here uh turn off ortho from here and i just type in 90 or sorry minus 90 in this case back in here come on don't start bugging out for me minus 90 enter there we go we get an arc you can also kind of do some circles and trimming, but this is faster. Um, so that's the only use case for it that I can find. And that is it. That's it with one dimensional objects. Now my voice is completely gone. So I will cover two dimensional objects and three dimensional objects um, tomorrow. But for you, it's going to be literally in five seconds. I'll see you there. All right, so now it's time to jump into two-dimensional uh, geometry creation tools and techniques. So the first command that I kind of want to show you, by the way, all of them are located, well, starting from this tool right here up until I would say where you have the cube, right? So all of these deal with stuff in two dimensions. And of course, as per usual, they expand, right? So you have more let's talk about the general ones uh, so the first one that i want to cover is a rectangle uh, this is the tool right here or you can just type in rectangle like so and by default it asks you to give it two opposite corner points of the rectangle so you can either do that with the mouse click click or if i were to hit enter to repeat the last command which is the rectangle I can also define, let's say, the first point with a uh, mouse click again, but then I can specify the length, as you can see here in the command line. So I can say, let's say 100 millimeters in length, enter, and then it asks me for the width, right? So I will specify 50, enter. And now I have a rectangle that is 100 by 50 millimeters pretty straightforward um, there are more instances uh, or more options how you can create a, a rectangle for instance around the curve or by the center point but honestly like the starting point length width seems to be the most useful um, if you want to have a tilted rectangle then you would be using three point uh, option let me quickly showcase how that works so if i were to create a box here box like so let's say my box is all messed up and all rotated around um something like this and i want to create a rectangle on this particular surface of the box right so now I could, you know, just start creating a rectangle. I could start drawing it. But the problem is that the rectangle, as per usual, is going to be flat. You know, flat compared to the current C plane, which is flat on the ground, um, of the document. Or um, actually of the view. So how do we fix that? Well, as I'm creating the rectangle, I can specify that I will be using a three-point method for creation which will basically ask me okay so where's your origin of the rectangle okay let's say that's that this point right here and then as you can see i'm free to give it a second point 
which basically asks me for the first edge of the rectangle. How is that oriented? So I can say, let's say it goes along here and I can type in also 100 millimeters like so. Or let's do less. Let's do like 20. Just so that we're fitting inside of the uh, box face. 20 millimeters right here. Just like that. So I just clicked it. And now the third button that I press is, or third time that I click, is going to be going to specify the orientation of the rectangle. So the first uh, click was the origin, second click was the orientation of the hinge, let's say, uh, of, of the edge. And the third uh, click is going to be the orientation of the actual rectangle. So I can specify, let's say, 40 right here. And then I can just click, let's see, on this point right here. And now I have a rectangle that is 20 by 40 millimeters and is perfectly oriented on this surface. We will be doing this quite a bit, or not quite a bit, but sometimes we will be doing this um, in later stages of this course. Let's delete all of these. So that's a rectangle. Polygon, which is right here, is described exactly the same way as how you would describe a sphere. So you just create a, uh, select the polygon. Um, you can here choose how many sides it has. So in this case, it's a hexagon. It has six sides. I can say pentagon, you know, with five sides. I can say octagon with eight sides, you know, and gone. How many I want. And I just drag it, click to specify an origin point drag it out, specify its radius, let's say 100, hit enter, and it's created, right? So pretty straightforward, it works exactly the same way as AutoCAD's polygon tool. Then we have, um, I guess we can, like th these are the only two ones, uh, these are the only two tools that I would consider to be two-dimensional but they are still uh, curve-based. From here on out, we're going to be moving into surface-based geometry. And the first thing that I will show to you is this surface from three or four corner points. I'm skipping over fillet curves and all of the different manipulation techniques of curves because that is going to be in a future chapter. So if you're interested in this and you don't care about the surfaces, just skip ahead. But Talking about the surfaces themselves, um, there are three different types of geometries in Rhino. I already mentioned this at the start of this um, of this course, but now I think it's time to actually talk about it a little bit more, because we are going to kind of be jumping into geometry, like three-dimensional geometry creation. So, I guess I can write here. One second. Mm, can I just do it this way? Nah. Okay, never mind. So, first type is NURBS surfaces. Second type is meshes or mesh. Third type is sub D. Right? So we have three types. Um, let me give you examples. Rhino, oh sorry, Revit or Archicad, BIM software uses NURBS surfaces as their baseline for geometry, uh, for the type of geometry. Um, Cinema 4D, Blender, 3ds Max, ZBrush, I'm blanking on different 3D modeling software now. Um, basically, animation-oriented uh, uh, 3D modeling software or rendering-oriented 3D modeling software uh, uses meshes. Sub-D geometry is a little bit more nuanced than that, and it's basically, um, you can think of it as um, mesh geometry that is smoothed out perfectly smoothed out to a degree where the mesh geometry becomes or is able to become NURBS geometry without with minimal amount of translation. We will be talking about all three of these during this 
course, but just to begin, we will work on with the NURBS services. So we are going to start with NURBS. And that is what, by the way, Rhino is based on. It's very good with about, uh, it's very good with NURBS services and it's based on it. It's okay, good, you know, it, it kind of is able to read and slightly work with meshes and sub D has been just recently added. So it seems like it's pretty powerful, but it's still in early stages of sub D. We will be using sub D type of geometry as well in the future portions of the video or of the course of the course that we're having right now. Uh, so in terms of NURB services, the way NURB services are described are through functions. So, you know, from, from math, f to x equals sine x, right? This creates something like this. Well, 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 you get what I mean, <laughs> right? Wait, let, let me make this a little bit cleaner. Ew, 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 ew. Why did I start doing this? Okay, like a sine wave. That, that's what I'm trying to draw here, a sine wave, right? So imagine if you have f to x equals sine x, and then you have some other function right here, f to x equals equals blah 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 um and then another one f to x equals something else right and all of these functions they kind of draw different types of graphs different types of curves right say something like this so you have well i i would need one more function right here equals right that's the curve number four then you can have one more function f to n equals um the, the the boundary between these four functions right and in doing so what you're creating is you're creating a surface right in between or i i should probably in doing so, you would be creating a surface right here. And that's, ex that's exactly how, um, how NURBS surfaces work. They are described by boundary conditions of different mathematical equations. Um, not just that, there's also like the curvature of the surface itself and a, a lot of additional stuff. But the basic idea is that you need to kind of have in your heads as you're kind of thinking about different types of geometry is that uh, NURBS is infinite in resolution, you know, because f to x equals sine x, that's it. You can add any number here and it's going to spit out a different number here, meaning that it's absolutely um unlimited in how many numbers you can have meaning infinite resolution um it's perfectly smooth all the time as long as you're dealing with a single surface and what else and it's heavy it's the heaviest type of geometry compared to any other type the meshes or sub -Ds. so if i were to now talk about meshes real quick so, you know, NURBS is math and Rhino is based on that. By the way, you don't need to know this kind of stuff uh, to be able to operate with NURBS geometry. This is just for me to preemptively, you know, show you why your NURBS building is going to be much, much heavier in terms of performance than your mesh building. Meshes are much easier to actually talk about. Meshes contain out of two things, uh, actually out of two lists. One list is a list of points. Point one has X, Y, Z, you know, coordinates where that point is located. Point two 
has coordinates x1, y1, z1, and so on. Then there's point 0.3, point 0.4, point 0.5. Let's say five points, right? A list of five, five points. So meshes contain points. Let me draw them. Pum, 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 pum. Five points, right? And let's say this is point 0.1. 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5. We're counting clockwise. Then meshes have a separate list, an another list, which is basic, which basically says quad, quad meaning four-sided uh, face, is made from 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And then let's say another item in the list, a triangle is made out of, um, one second, point 0.1, uh, point 0.4 and point 0.5, right? So in this case, we have a quad and a triangle. So how would that look like if I were to actually build a mesh? Right? We have the points here and we have assembly instructions how, how a mesh is made. Well, then I would go to mesh tools. I would say I'm going to create a single mesh face and let's just go, go and kind of read this as a program would. Point 0.1, point 0.2. So that's point 0.1. Then point 0.2 is here. Then point 0.3 is here. Point 0.4 is here. Okay, enter. This is our rectangular quad right here and then a triangle between point 0.1, point 0.4 and point 0.5 okay point 0.1, point 0.4, point 0.5 enter right so now I have a triangle and uh, a rectangle these two uh, let me do one thing right here so that you actually see them I'm going to the display tab if you can't see the display tab click the little gear icon here and enable the display tab and here i'm just choosing um mesh wires also if you're interested in why backside of my geometry is red and front side is white i have under here object settings color back faces i have that turned on and here for back face color i have it set to red Right, so if I have it turned off, then the back side is also going to be, you know, same same color as the front side. Um, I'll keep it uncolored just so that it's not confusing for you. Okay, so that is, uh, you know, one is deals with mathematics, the other one deals with lists of points and their assembly instructions. Third one, sub D, is basically uh some details is basically um uh, same procedure as a mesh i can actually borrow it here borrow it here and let's say one two three four like that and uh, let me just quickly do this and then i'll explain what the hell you're you're seeing like that like that okay so sub d <laughs> this is weird, I know, but sub D is basically the same thing as the mesh. It has points and it has its assembly instructions, but it also has one more kind of information row as to how things are um, smoothed, right? Which areas of the geometry are smoothed and which are not. And the way it smooths is by using, I believe it uses Catmull Clark algorithm. I might be wrong. And if I were to quickly draw the Catmull Clark al algorithm for you, it would look like something like this. So let's say a quad and a triangle, real quick. I'm just drawing curves right now just to be able to explain to you, like so. Then um, what the algorithm does, it basically uh, for every quad, it creates 
four quads for every triangle that goes from midpoint. Uh, oh no. Yeah, it takes the center point of the triangle and it creates a line, an edge to every midpoint of the triangle like so. Yes, 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 yes. That's how it does it, right? So it divides it up, but it doesn't just divide it up. It also creates this kind of a, uh, interesting effect where it enables the, the, the quad to smooth out by slowly moving the corner point back towards its center point. And the mathematic is, math mathematics are quite simple. Uh, if you have the midpoint of the diagonal here, so it's the midpoint from the midpoint, so somewhere here, right? So it slowly kind of smooths out. And then here it would be um, a little bit more awkward than that, something like that. And then here it kind of catches that same e, e, and so on, right? So it keeps uh, keeps smoothing out the geometry. And this is like iteration number one. I messed up one of them. One second. It needs to do something like so, right? So this inner blob that you see here is iteration one. If you go through infinite amount of iterations, then it looks like this, right? It fi fi finishes moving out to um, this perfectly rounded shape. Uh, so sub D is able to take finite geometry type, such as a mesh, and smooths it out to something that has infinite amount of resolution, meaning that it becomes a little bit closer to being a NURBS geometry, which means that converting from a sub D into NURBS becomes possible, right? And that's what we're going to be also working on a little bit later, especially with the landscapes, because with the landscapes, you can achieve pretty interesting results while working with a mesh. Let me just quickly show you, um, I guess, a teaser, <laughs> right? You can easily take the edges, kind of lift them up to however you want, you know, it, and it constantly keeps the smoothness of the geometry that you're, that you're working with, which means that landscaping can become quite, quite nice. And if you want to, you can always, oops, sharpen it up a bit. So notice how Two edges here makes it a little bit more sharper and one edge here makes it go very smooth. So you can play around with those, but that is going to, <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's too early. It's too early. Okay. So now with that said, that being said, and that being done, we can jump back to um, the surface creation and actually talk about the NURBS surface creation, first of all, right? So the tool here that you see here is surface from three or four corner points. And if I select this tool, uh, we can simply create a surface by click, 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 click. Clicking four times, it creates a surface. And just to be sure, I believe you will be seeing this ISO, um, I, these ISO curves as well. So just you know, these just help you understand if the surface is curving or not, or if it's flat. They are not a part of the geometry. All right. So other um, like the, this four point surface doesn't have any other ways of how you can um, use it. It's just as simple as clicking four times. So not, not much, nothing much to do with that. Um, then let's create a planner surface, a surface that is flat. A planner surface can be created from any uh, boundary um, that is defined by either one or multiple curves that is enclosed. 
so for instance, if I were to take a NURBS curve and just kind of draw, draw around, you know, some sort of a blob and make sure that your end snaps are turned on. So you need to have this object snap turned on and end snaps to be turned on. And then make sure that as you're finishing up the curve, you're clicking on its starting point so that, you know, it becomes enclosed. Since we're drawing on an empty screen, it's always going to lay it flat on the ground, meaning that we know for sure that this curve in particular is flat. And then we can just run a planner SRF, short for surface planner SRF command, enter. Easy as that we have created a planner surface, right? The original curve and its planner surface. If I were to t select the curve and lift, let's say these three points, cor uh, construction or control, control points up like that, this is not a flat curve anymore. And if I select it and create a, try to create a planner surface, it will say no faces were made, curve must be closed and planner. So that doesn't work. Um, if you wanted to create a surface from something like this, then it would become a um, much, much more difficult thing to do because there are so many different ways on how you can create a surface um, through here or rather what type of surface can be created here. So you would need, need to make a lot of decisions right as to how does this whole thing bend and how does this whole thing work okay let's delete that that's the planner surface um then we have network surface network surface basically is um apologies before we do a network surface let's create a loft a loft is going to be easier to showcase and and to explain so Notice how I'm just kind of taking the four point surface, the little triangle there and expanding all of the different tools. We're basically going through these tools right now. So I'm just going to explain them to you one by one. And here we're at network surface, but I will skip ahead and I'll show you the loft first. A loft is pretty nice. Um, let's do a small little example. I will create a curve any curve, you know, and holding the alt key and with the gumball turned on, I will copy it up by just holding the alt key and dragging it up like that. And I will copy it up once more like that. Then uh, the middle one, I will mess around with its control points. You just kind of drag them around. Sure. Something like that. What the loft does, it creates a surface that gets interpolated through the lines, through a series of curves. So we can either click here on the loft tool or we can type in loft and choose the curves to loft. So these three. Hit enter and it just creates a loft for us. See, just a surface there. And we can uh, switch between different types of loft. So normal loft will force the surface to go through the curves. Loose loft will use the, um, the in-between curves as mo mostly as control points or as attractors rather than uh, geometry through which the surface must follow. Tight loft will, um, like basically the difference between normal loft and tight loft is just within the angle of how much influence does the curves in between the start and the end curve have. Uh, so the tight loft will definitely kind of have a stronger, um, it will force the in between sections to have a stronger presence, let's say, or stronger effect. 
straight sections means that you will have discontinuities right along the middle uh, middle sections and then uniform honestly i never use uniform sorry can't can't explain it since i never use it uh, usually like 99 percent of the time you use normal very occasionally you use loose and maybe once a year or once every five years you use straight sections nothing more so in terms of other options here there's the closed loft option which basically makes the loft as it's being created loop back into the start uh, start of the so the last curve that we had loops back to the first curve and the loft that is created is um, enclosed I can show this better if I were to create one more curve do something like this like that so I'm just copying and I'm gonna loft it again one two three four so this is not closed and this is closed so now you get what I mean right all right a uh, split at tangents basically means that would, would you like the surface to be split along the curves? No, you don't. Uh, you should almost never rebuild the loft. That is bad. <laughs> um, rebuilding a loft you, usually only is useful if the curves that you are using are very messed up. If they are your own curves don't rebuild the loft because things will stop aligning as you can see here so do not simplify hit okay you have yourselves a little form right something like this so that's the loft then for um in terms of using an edge surface you know so so i talked about the loft but oh one more thing sorry one more thing about the loft you can never do something like this. Let's say one, two, three curves, and then I create a circle. Let's say like here, move it up. And I try to loft between these, you know, so that it starts as a surface and it ends as a circle. If I try to loft it this way, two, three, four, it's going to complain by saying unable to loft, select either open or closed curves, but not both. So you can indeed loft between um, numerous circles or any enclosed shape for that matter. For instance, let's say something like that. Loft, pew, 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 pew. you know. Sure, you can do that, but you can't loft between a closed curve and an open one. That is not allowed against the rules. Then you have um, the tool that we skipped over, surface from network of curves. And I will show you, so basically network of curves is as if you're lofting, but in two directions simultaneously. So let me show you what I mean by that. If I were to create an interpolated points curve through here and then through here and let's say at the end right here and let's do one more. I'm just basically click, just clicking uh, with the near snap turned on, just selecting points on the curves. So I have this. This is like a network of curves, right? And I can I can and I can take this and I can start messing around with the with the profiles here like so so I have even more control over what what's going on with the curves so I can say that oh no this should actually lift out like so and let's say the ed edges are what whatever they are um, then I can use network uh, surface, this tool right here, 
or you can just type in network surface SRF and technically as long as you're within a grid if you select <coughs> sorry if you select the all of the curves and if it's some something relatively close to a grid it should automatically be able to automatically sort and as you can see here it kind of fits a surface into the network that you have drawn and you can specify to use loose rather than uh, just according to position which creates less iso curves and so on and i mean there's there's a bunch of um different parameters that i don't want to um overly explain over explain uh, for now all you need to know is position uh, is more accurate but creates heavier geometry while loose creates less but is less accurate right so this gives you more uh like mo more control um we as architects almost never use network surface because it's enough to just use a loft um network surface as i understand it is mostly used by um extremely complex uh, for extremely complex surface creation such as shoes for instance out of all the things right shoes or a ship hull sure but shoes are cooler cooler to say right so we have a um, network of surface done and explained poorly then <laughs> edge surface okay so in terms of edge surface um, it's sometimes useful when you're trying to just fill in some sort of an opening and the way it works is it's like a planner surface only that it uh, can be distorted right so let's say um let's create a rectangle like so then select a rectangle explode the rectangle into four segments one two three four right so we explode it then we take um let's say let's mess it up so let's take this segment right here or let's take all of the set uh, segments all of them drag around all of them and rebuild them rebuild a command rebuild where we can actually say how many control points each segment should have so i can say instead of original two we'll talk about this tool in in a short while but for now just trust me on this uh let's do four sorry let's do four control points with degree three hit ok now as you select the curve you can see these little control points appear which you can push and pull on right so you can mess things up like that and let's say these two they go up and these two they go down right so there is no way that you can Technically, you could use network surface, by the way, on this, if I... Yeah, I think you can. Yeah, yeah, you can use network surface, but this is not that tutorial. This is tutorial explaining the edge surface. So we will be using surface uh, or edge surface and just selecting these four edges right here. And it creates a very clean, very smooth surface from any four edges that you give it you can also create a surface from three edges so let me just draw one here one two three and it's going to give you surface like that or you can create a surface from two edges i believe one two yeah it's just going to create a surface like that uh, visually these two surfaces should be almost identical let's overlap them yes mm, are they yeah this one has much higher curvature than this one because of this edge right here so this is where it starts becoming a little bit 
funky and a little bit hard to control is the curvature how things are bending and so on but uh, over time you get the hang of it there's no speed running this so at surface um you just kind of give it a bunch of uh, joined up or not joined up but touching curves and it creates a surface in between them patch this tool right here so patch is able patch can even create a surface from points and some lines and the lines are not planar and they are not even closed and the points are all over the place and you just select the whole damn thing and you type in patch and it gives you like the t settings i will just do 10 by 10 hit ok and it just creates a surface that fits perfectly onto all of the geometry right here that's patch patch is not accurate uh, every time when you want to fill in a hole with and you want to use a patch command you will have a bad time patch is basically it takes a network of potential curves and it tries to fit that network onto a given set of geometry as i've shown here the problem is again patch the problem is that you give it resolution right right here how many uh, curves does it fit and the bigger the number 50 by 50 the bigger the number the more accurate the fitting is going to be but this number can never be infinite meaning the accuracy is never going to be infinite there's always going to be be small gaps so be very careful with how you use patch for landscapes and whatnot it's fine for architecture, I strongly suggest against it. Okay. With that done, there are of course other other techniques uh, how you can kind of create stuff and so on, like sweeps and whatnot. But we will uh, talk about those as we're creating a pavilion or something like that, <clears throat> like an example project. Um, I guess that's that with two-dimensional objects let's move on to three dimensions so boxes spheres and whatnot uh, we will talk about meshes and sub -D geometry after this chapter um, but just just in terms of three-dimensional objects i will try to focus as much as possible on the nerves geometry as we've done with the two-dimensional objects so box right here generates a box uh, two ways uh, two main ways of how you can create a box you just uh, by clicking anywhere on the screen you start drawing the box and then you can type in um, any any amount uh, in terms of the length so let's say 100 millimeters enter the width 200 millimeters enter and the height 100 millimeters enter and we you have a box 100 by 200 by 100 right uh, you can also create a box with three points and that is useful when let's say this is going to be a very sim similar example as to what i showed with the rectangle so three point box start of the edge let's say here end of the edge here orientation of the box base here and then to which direction do you want to move out the box let's say here just creates a box aligned to a certain um, plane that you have described by the origin point the x and the y right so that's box creation nothing too fancy uh, sphere creation is literally the same thing as drawing a circle same thing for cylinder um, well cylinder is drawing a circle and giving it a uh, height so radius and then 100 millimeters for the height and for the sphere you just give it a center point and the radius 100 millimeters right so these are very very easy to 
create. Um, and these are like the, you know, the typical solids that you see in any 3D software. Uh, then a little bit more difficult is, are these kind of uh, geometries that need additional uh, or starting geometry to be created, such as a pipe, for instance. So if you have a curve, bum, 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 if you have a curve and you want to make a pipe through this curve, well, you select it and you type in a pipe, pipe, enter. It asks you for what's the radius. You can also give it a diameter, but let's operate with the radius for now. 50. No, that's way too much. <laughs> 10. Then it kind of shows you a little circle here, uh, specifying how big 10 is going to be. And there are more options here. Output surface or output sub D. Um, so even here you can switch between different types of geometry. Right now we're still, um, I'm still explaining everything with surfaces. So we stick to surface. Then should it be uh, thickened or non-thickened? Meaning, um, does it have, give me a second. Um, does it create a single skin tube or a double skin tube? I hope that that's, that's the best way of me explaining this. Then what's the end cap? So uh, let's just create a qu quick one with the end cap being flat. That's how it looks like. So this is, this is the flat end cap. Let's create another one with end cap being round. That's the round end cap. Who would have thought? And let's create the last one with end cap being none. No. No end, right? Uh, so usually you want to have your cap being flat. Um, sometimes round, but round it gets very heavy if you have a lot of different pipes. So if you can help it, use a flat end cap. And then there's like fitting to rail, uh, shape blending and so on. You don't care about these settings. Those are very, very niche. So just know that there is a radius and there is a type of the end cap for the pipe. And of course, the curve doesn't need to be um, planner. Right? For this to work. So wires and whatnot, you can do them. Um, so that's pipe. Uh, sweep is advanced pipe. So if I were to have, let's say, a curve, something like this, and I, I don't want it to be a round pipe, I want it to have some sort of a fancier geometry, I can create, uh, I, or rather in the top view, let's say, I can draw whatever geometry I want to sweep. So let's draw something very ugly something like that whatever I'm not being accurate at all I know but it's um, just this kind of a U shape mm. yeah good enough good enough uh, then I will take this U shape and I will rotate it and I will move it by using M enter move enter make sure make sure that the midpoint snapping is turned on and i'll move it from the bottom midpoint to this end point right here just like that and i'll kind of rotate it so that it's perpendicular to the start of the curve and we can mess around with the curve as well if you want to you know give it a little bit of a bump so now if I use sweep, uh, sweep one, sweep one, it can be found uh, right here, by the way, under the surface creation, sweep one, sweep one rail. It asks me to give it a rail. So this is the rail. And then immediately without me even pressing enter, it asks me to give it a, a shape to sweep. So I give it this weird U profile. I hit enter, 
I hit enter again, I hit enter again, and I get this swept profile right here. So now you can kind of start seeing why this is a powerful tool. Um, you can also mess around with the profiles. So let me copy the cross section here, like this profile here. Let me make a copy of it, kind of rotate it, position it at the end of the sweep, like that. And actually, let's just, let's just rotate it maybe. Or let's mirror it in the Z axis by minus one. So you, you just scale things. As I mentioned before, if you want to mirror something along a certain axis, you just select the object, you click on the scaling widget here, either here or here. In this case, we're mirroring along the Z axis, so the blue one, and you scale it by minus one. And that is going to force like an inverted type for this particular geometry. And then I just eh, position it like so. And let's see. Sweep one. This is my rail, my section, my section, enter. This time I need to be a little bit more careful as to where um, it's going to start. And on, on each of the cross sections, I think this is going to be okay, maybe. Actually, I kind of want the cross section to be perhaps here, something like that. Yep. And you can see since it's twisting, right? It's rotating as it's being twisted. It's uh, messing up right in the middle. So let's align cross sections, use align cross sections and change the direction of this one so that and you can change the direction, by the way, by just clicking on the little arrow there. Uh, so that the sweep, yeah, the sweep is now self-intersecting. So it's, we're asking it to do a little bit too much in terms of completely changing its direction as it's rotating, unless we give it one more cross section in the middle. Like that. And remember, you can always right click the gumball and choose align to object to actually rotate stuff around the, the, the plane of the object. Don't forget about that. So we have something like this. Gumball align to C plane, back to that. Sweep. One. Rail. The sweeping shapes, this one, this one, this one. Enter. And now we kind of try to follow along this corner. So this corner, as the profile is rotating, it's not going to be here, but rather it's going to be here. And it's going to be flowing along this edge, which is correct. So basically the arrow does need to look downwards. And then as it's going to be kind of, as it's going to continue rotating, it's going to be here, right? And flowing along this edge. So now I believe if we take a look at this, right, as, as this thing is rotating and hit OK, you can see that it starts here in the top. As it's moving through the curve, it's rotating here. Like that. And then it's it continues rotating until it's upside down. Right? And in doing so, we have just successfully created a pretty damn intense profile. <laughs> right? Um, this could be, you know, a, a pretty, pretty cool facade, for instance. Or, or a case study for a volume. All right, so that is sweep one with one rail. You can also do a fancy sweep with two rails. So remember everything that I said about a single curve, like a sweep with a single curve, and just uh, imagine that you can do exactly the same thing with sweep two 
or a tool that is located right here, sweep to rails. So first rail, second rail, cross section curve, enter, enter, enter. And it creates, it interpolates the curve between two rails. Also might be a very useful thing for you. I use it sometimes. Okay, now we have um, a few more tools to go through before we will start actually doing something fun funny. Funny? Fun. Something fun. So, Revolve. Revolve is another tool that we will kind of focus on. Let's jump to the front view. And basically what Revolve does, it takes a profile and it spins it around a certain axis to create a form. So you can imagine that most of the forms that are revolved are going to be like columns or vases, 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 um, cups and whatnot. So let's just create um, a curve. It's gonna be something like so, maybe. Then it goes down. And maybe it's like that. Sure. Something like this. You know, a little curve here. Um, I kind of want to give it a little bit more, but sure. For, for now, let, let's just have it this way. Uh, and I have created it in the front view. Don't forget. So if I want to create a surface from this, all I need to do is just revolve it, right? So revolve revolve select curves this one select or start of revolve axis and i want to revolve it along this y axis this yellow line right so my start is going to be at zero i just type in zero enter end of revolve axis i just shift click uh, by the way when you hold down the shift key it makes it so that your uh, directions snap to 90 degree angles. So it's like uh, for a short time turning on the ortho snap. So as I'm holding the shift key, I can just snap to any point along the Y axis like so, and it's going to start revolving. Now we can actually jump to perspective view because it's nicer to see it there. And you can see that my cross section is revolving and I can specify what's the start angle. And let's say the start angle is indeed zero. So I just hit enter. I don't need to type anything. And now as I'm moving my mouse, it's creating this nice, uh, nice effect here. Right? And instead of uh, using the mouse, I can again type in 360 degrees, hit enter. I have a weird little vase, right? That has an opening at the top and the bottom, but you can easily unclose these because these are flat with, you might be thinking planner surface tool, not really. For uh, this type of a geometry, you can just type in cap, C-A-P, like a hat, cap. And as long as your holes are flat, it's going to create a cap for the top and the bottom. And now this is an enclosed poly surface, right? That was revolved. So that's revolve. Then we have extrude curve. So in terms of extruding the curves, uh, you can extrude mostly anything, uh, any type of a curve. And it's a procedure that uh, you use to create a surface from a single curve, right? So for instance, if I have this kind of a curve right here, and I just want to make a wall out of it, I could technically just make a copy of it and just loft between the two. I typed in loft, uh, loft between the two and I get a surface, but the most, much faster way would be to just select the curve and click on this. See this blue dot here? That is a possibility to not move the curve as what you would do with the arrow, but rather extrude the curve into a surface when you click on the dot. And I can even be precise about it. I can click on the dot and type in 100. And now 
the height is 100. Of course, I can extrude the curve in any direction I want. X or Y. Well, Y really messes it up. Uh, but for now, let's keep it at li like so. There's also a possibility to extrude curve with a command. Extrude CRV. CRV short for curve. Select curves. This bad boy right here. Enter. And you just extrude it. Easy as that. Again, you can type in um, you can type in a number and in millimeters is going to extrude as much as you want. So that's extrude curve. Extrude surface is well, actually let's let's have that curve that we've just extruded because it does generate a surface. Right? Um actually let's give me a second. Let's have it like that. There we go. So we have a surface and you can again extrude the surface. So you select the surface and you just yoink, extrude it along the X axis, for instance, or you extrude it along the Y axis. Uh, ew, it doesn't like to be extruded along the Y axis. I assume if you tried to extrude the surface along the Z axis, it would just kind of break. Yeah, it just moves it. It doesn't extrude. So in this case, x-axis is naturally you know the, the the cleanest extrusion because nothing overlaps no nothing intersects you can also use extrude srf tool and choose a direction direction let's say from here to here this direction right so you can specify a direction either with the mouse or you can uh, type in the direction um, with the coordinates. So you can, for instance, say 1, 0, 0 would be the x direction or, or not. That's weird. Oh, that, that was my bad. I'm sorry. Again, direction, base point. So 0 and then 1 comma zero comma zero yeah that gives you a direction along the x axis i prefer to use extrude when i'm extruding to just use the gumball that's much faster okay uh offset surface so you might think that extrude and offset are two uh, are very similar things, you know, like you extrude the surface to give to thicken it and you offset the surface to thicken it. Not really. Uh, there are differences to it. First of all, I will show you the offset surface in action. So this is my surface. I type in offset surface, select uh, poly surfaces to offset. So th this bad boy right here, enter, and I give it a distance of right and it offsets oh and i forgot to enable solid offset so it just gives me an additional surface here so let me undo this and do this again offset surface this time solid yes so i turn on this option to be yes enter and now it gives me um you know a solid block like a wall uh, from from the initial surface um, so you might think, okay, so what's the difference between extrusion and offsetting? Well, I, I will show you it in an example. You don't need to follow along. Um, if I were to create a surface here, let me just quickly do something, something like so. Bear with me for a second. Let's do even more aggressive, like that, 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 yeah, okay, cool, and that, okay, so one of these I'm just going to extrude along the z-axis by 20, 20 millimeters, right, the other one I will offset surface by 20 right this one looks a little bit more messed up than this one this one looks cleaner but wait till i create a section with a clipping plane through these 
Um, don't worry about the clipping plane, we'll get to it. Right? So now we're kind of cutting through these. Notice how the cross section in this dome, that where we used offset surface, always stays 20 millimeters. While here, yes, right here it's 20 millimeters, but here it's definitely not. And that's because the angle, you know, that's because we extruded everything at um, along the z-axis and things that are tilting quite heavily along that axis like the parts of the surface that are tilting generates much less thickness because you're initially uh, what you're doing is you are making something like this right in in terms of thickness so here it's fine but the more the steeper you go the thinner it gets uh, so it's non, a non-variable extrusion, while here the extrusion or the offset is variable, right? This is why it had to create much more, much denser NURBS polysurface, but at the same time why uh, this is more accurate. So offset surface, really good when you are trying to keep things consistent. Um, and I guess in terms of form creation, that is about it. The only additional thing that I want to showcase before we jump to form manipulation is actually the, 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 the sub-D geometry and uh, like a quick introduction to tools that you can find with sub-D. So under uh, sub-D tools right here, the tab called sub-D tools, you will see literally every every tool that is available to you with, uh, that deals with sub-D geometry. The easiest one is creating a single sub-D phase. You can choose to either create a three-point sub-D phase or four-point. If you are creating four-point sub-D phase, it's much, much easier. <laughs> Just trust me on that. Or you can create a sub-D plane. So what's the difference between these two? Sub-D plane basically draws like a rectangle. You click, click once, click twice, you get a sub -D geometry to toggle between soft display and uh, control point display i think i don't remember how it's uh, the sharp display and the soft display to toggle between those it's the tab key on your keyboards tab t a b left hand side so you can toggle between the soft and the hard as I'm modeling, I'm always looking at the hard display and I'm just toggling to soft to see how it's kind of rounding off the shapes. So this is plain, uh, right? If I want to create a single sub face, I just click, 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 click. And then once I'm done, it will let you do a pentagon, but please don't. Uh, four is the limit. I hit enter and now I have two shapes. Notice how this shape right here, it smooths out much less than this one. And that is because there are these edges here. So these are not like in surface isocurves. These actually are edges that are existing and you can actually select them. You can select them by holding control shift and clicking on them. Right, And then you can move them up to the side wherever you want and you can start shaping your form as you please. So how, why did they, how did they get there? Well, let's create another plane and this time let's look at the settings here. Notice how it asks you what's the X count and the Y count. If I were to say the X count is 50 and the Y count, I'm just clicking on them, 50, and I draw the plane again, it's creating this grid. And this is, by the way, the smooth version of this grid. So notice how only this corner is getting smoothed out. So the answer is the more, the higher the resolution, the more edges you have next to each other, the better they will hold the form that you're trying to describe, right? So that's that. 
Um, in terms of uh, working with SubD, I would suggest that you think about it as a, uh, or you work with it as a sculptor and you create, you, you start with a cube. I always start with a cube. So just creating a box. Oh, sorry, I forgot to X count, Y count, Z count, right? For the box. Always do two by two by two. Because it's very easy to add edges as long as you have at least one loop inside of the, your faces. And just create a cube. Uh, 100 by 100 by 100. Right? Something like that. If I press tab, it looks like that. Nothing fancy. Um, so remember control shift click that selects one edge. Control shift double click selects all the, the, the loop of edges, right? As long as it can select the loop of the edges. Sometimes, you know, for instance, here it can't, it has too many options on where it can go. So it terminates. This is called the termination point, right? Or a discontinuity, if you will. Usually it terminates on vertices that have valence of three. Um, by valence, I mean how many, <laughs> by vertices, I mean points. And by valence, I mean how many edges stick out from each point, right? So usually in a quad mesh, in a clean grid, you have always four uh, edges sticking out from each point, right? Uh, this makes it so that catching directions on that grid are very simple. If you have a point that has three edges sticking out of it, then usually that means some part of the grid terminates at that edge or at that vertice. And that is uh, indeed the case with corners of a cube. That is a tension point right here. So why am I saying this, all of this to you? Well, if you want to shape things very quickly, you usually want to be able to uh, control the geometry with just the um by by selecting the, the the edge loops and kind of pushing and pulling them around by the way it's not just the edge loops you can also select the polygon groups like like that right but i'm just going to give you a very quick example so let's say these two polygons i move them out like so these two I move them out like so uh, what else can we do perhaps these two edges move them up mm. That might look bad. Maybe we take all four of these polygons, move them up, but also rotate them a, a little bit and move them out like so. Something like that. You know, hit tab. Doesn't look like much, doesn't look great. That's fine. We keep working on it. Uh, then let's say I want to introduce more resolution here. What do I do? Well, I can use insert edge command which asks me to select edge from loop so i can select you know let's say this edge it gives me the whole loop i hit enter and then it asks me which 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 corner or sorry which side do i want to insert more edges towards let's say here so now i have more edges to work with for instance these guys that i can lift up and push out like so Right. So slowly we start um, messing around with this geometry and slowly we start shaping it into something that can be, you know, that can become a building. It's still very soft, um, but then we remember that, oh yeah, if we have more edges next to each other, so for instance, these, these edges close, very close to each other it's going to hold the shape better, right? And the more we have, the better it's gonna hold. So you can always take an edge and create a bevel, command called bevel, uh, and create two edges from one. You can uh, choose how many segments you have. I, uh, right here, so five for instance, and creates this kind of fillet. You don't wanna do that, please don't do that. Segments one, let's, let's be, um, 
let's not go overboard with this but you can see how much it 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 starts kind of sharpening up right same thing here bevel a little bit like that then you notice that oh you can also uh, there are these uh, circles on the on, on, on the axes which you can use to extrude things, right? So you can even use use them to extrude and select these, extrude these out, and so on. So you can start shaping things um, as much as you want and messing with the scale of things. This is much more sculptural. And it's excellent for landscaping. Like if you're dealing with landscaping uh, for architecture, well, as long as you know what you're you're doing, as long as you're in control, it's fine to kind of go through iterations of designs. But in terms of realization, um, it's quite a difficult tool to use. So for conceptual design, great. For realizations, I think sticking to NURBS should be your top one priority. Uh, especially when you're still learning the program. Okay, that, that was a very quick kind of showcase and introduction to sub-D geometry and sub-D modeling of geometry. Um, of course, there are more tools than just uh, the small, uh, like the these ones that we've covered. But at least now you know the principle and, you know, you can learn by playing around with it. All right, so now uh, with geometry creation out of the way, next step is going to be actually talking about how you can modify geometry once it is created. Um, I will, as per usual, go through the most useful set of tools right now. Okay, so in terms of geometry manipulation, there are so many different tools in Rhino that there is no way that I can cover all of them. So as per usual, I will try to showcase only the key ones that I find to be most useful and we will kind of stumble upon new ones as we will be doing a certain kind of example project um, at later stages. So for now, um, let's call these form modifiers, I guess. Um, in terms of the simplest ones, uh, you have splitting and trimming. These two are kind of the, 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 the basis for most of the operations that are being done. So trimming, uh, for instance, for a curve, and it's very simple to show it for a curve, but it works with any type of geometry as long as it's not a mesh, by the way, or a sub-D, as long as it's nerves. So I should probably premise that all of the modifiers that I will be showing right now are going to be NURBS oriented and NURBS based. So if we have, let's say, a polyline, something like that, and we have another one like that, we can use this polyline right here to trim away, let's say, this portion. How do you do that? Well, you type in trim, enter. This ball line is your cutting one, or this line segment is the cutting object. Notice how it's asking us to give it a cutting object. So we select it, we hit enter, and then it asks us to select an object to trim. Bam, that's it. It gets deleted. Hit enter, That that's about it. So um, if I were to, for instance, um, show it really quickly. Um, if we just type in trim, select everything as our cutting object, enter, then we can technically trim things with themselves. And in doing so, we can clean up uh, geometry quite quickly. Like that. And then use join, join, to join up the curves back into one polyline. Right. So initially what we've done is removed a corner. Right? So that's what trimming does. Splitting is I have one line right here. And let's say I have two more like that. 
Uh, if I want to split this curve into three curves with these two segments, I would type in split and I would read what it asks me of. So notice how with trimming it first asks me uh, to give it a um, line with which or geometry with which you will trim. In this case it's opposite. It first asks me select objects that you wish to split. In this case, it's the line right here, enter. And then it asks me for cutting objects, which are these two additional lines here. Doesn't seem like anything happened, geometrically speaking, but if I read the command line, it says one curve split into three pieces. So that means one, two, three. It actually did it, right? So splitting, um, you can think of splitting as trimming while you keep both of the parts still inside of your document. So it's less destructive. If I were to kind of expedite this to, is that a correct way of using the term? If I were to showcase it with three dimensional objects or two dimensional objects, uh, it would look something closer to this you know we have a box any size of the box doesn't matter uh, we just create a surface whatever surface we rotate the sur surface awkwardly and make it so that the surface intersects with the box oh by the way one thing uh, is while this will would work right and I can let me first show you and then show you what wouldn't work. So if I have the surface, I type in trim, trim, select the surface, enter, and then click on the box uh, corner. You know, I have su successfully removed portion of the box. Then I can, um, I can actually do the exactly same thing. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Um, I can do exactly the same thing as I've shown you with the polyline and the quick cleanup by selecting all of the geometry, typing in trim, and then choosing to trim away the outside portion of the surface. You can see that there's a small triangle still left there. And then just using that triangle to trim away this corner of the box and then selecting the remaining geometry and typing in join. And now I have a box with a cutaway corner, right? So it's it's initially exactly the same procedure as what we've done with um, with polylines, right? Splitting would work exactly the same way. I will not be showcasing that because that's too repetitive, but I will show you a problematic uh, trim. So something like this, Perfect. Something like this wouldn't work. Why? That's because this surface right here doesn't reach the end of the box. So this part of the box is not an island. It's not completely removed or separated from the rest of the box body by the surface. There is still a bridge here, meaning that if I used to trim, I cut with the surface and I try to trim the box, I'm clicking on it, it nothing happens. That's because it's not, um, it's not succeeding, I guess. Uh, I can show you another example of this. Let's say these two curves are intersecting. Let me extrude both of them into surfaces and let's move one of the surfaces down. Trim. With this surface, we trim away this. Again, doesn't work because there is like a bridge here that connects, reconnects that surface back into itself. But if we have a complete, I, I can make it even harder. If we have a complete kind of separation of two sides of the surface and I use the same technique, trim, this is my cutting object, enter, and I click on one side. That works perfectly. So make sure that things are intersecting properly before you trim. That's the that's the name of the game. Okay, let's move on. So I've showed you um, 
rebuild before but I didn't really talk about it as much so now we can talk about it I will start by uh, showing you rebuild on a curve and then we will um, move on to rebuilding a surface so let's just draw let's just draw a single straight line follow line click click enter single straight line if I select this line, you can see that this line has two points, start point and end point that I can click on and I can move them around. These are initially this curves control points. It doesn't have more, right? That's why it's always straight. How do we make more control points by rebuilding? So we select this curve and we type in rebuild hit enter and here it this kind of menu pops up where it asks us how many points do you want by the way in the brackets that's how many points you currently have we have two maybe we want four right not too many four is fine and then it asks us what's the degree we want degree three okay degree um degree one is a polar line it's basically straight line segments so between each control point you have a straight line segment no curvature whatsoever degree two are arcs so you have arc connecting to an arc connecting to an arc that's autocad way of doing it <clears throat> degree three is nerves curves that is a completely perfectly smooth um, type of geometry i guess that cannot be exploded and is only um described mathematically right so it doesn't have sub components it's a uniform curvature object uh, there's also degree four five six seven nine thousand nine hundred five fifty five there are infinite amount of degrees but after degree three um let's just say we as architects we don't use anything more than degree three and you shouldn't use degree two unless you know exactly what you're working on and what why you want to use degree two so point count for degree three will do the trick delete input yes because we want the new rebuilt curve to substitute the old one create new object on the current layer no we don't want to do that mix up differently no don't care preserve and tangent tangent directions there are no and tangent directions don't worry about it just delete the input don't have anything uh tick mark here hit ok you get your control points so now we have four by the way if you don't see the control points for some reason the shortcut for them is f10 the keyboard button f10 if you don't have f10 for i don't know why you wouldn't but let's say you don't let's say cat stole it or something uh you can type in points on a command that will force all of the control points of an object to be shown and then you can select the control points and you, you can move them around all right so now you can make the straight line curvilinear okay um, let me show you degree one and then we'll move on to two-dimensional things or three-dimensional things rather uh, so I will rebuild this again come on rebuild this again but this time instead of degree three I will use degree one hit ok and now you can see that it's a polyline with straight line segments as promised right let's go back to playing with surfaces i will create a surface for co four corner point surface just like that the size doesn't matter if i hit f10 you can see that the corner points of the surface are the only things that are um, being used to describe this you know we literally just clicked four times those are the control points and I can mess around with them, right? I can lift one of them and kind of create a little bit of curvature here, but that's nothing, uh, nothing too fancy. So let's rebuild this. Rebuild. 
And rebuilding a surface is exactly the same thing as rebuilding a curve, except that you get uh, control points in two directions rather than one, because it's X, Y, or in this case, U and V directions. And of course you get the degrees as well in two directions. So four by four, three by three, that should be perfect. Hit OK, hit F10, and you get more control points. So now we can, you know, let's say we select these, let's select these two as well, right there, move them up, you get a little dome here, right? Just a little bit more and you will be able to make a church. Um, so you, by the way, to get rid of the control points, just escape. So you get something like this. If I were to rebuild this again, and this time I would choose degree one for both of these, hit OK. Now we can see that my surface is actually jagged, right? That's because it's using pole lines as its kind of construction curves. Um, and, you know, it makes it sharp. So you can kind of make really interesting things if you say that, okay, my point count is 10 by 10 and my degrees are three. Oops, that was stupid. Three. My degrees are three in U direction and one in V direction. Hit OK. Now I can see that it's kind of we get these kind of ribbons. Let me redo this real quick. Rebuild again. 10 by 10, 3 and 1. Hit OK. Yeah. And I think in Arctic view. No, not in Arctic. In Arctic, it's too white. Uh, EMAP. Yeah, with EMAP, you can really see that it's smooth along one direction and it's jagged along the other. By the way, EMAP. Uh, you select an object, type in EMAP. It's going to probably show you this. Uh, this is very good when you are trying to see if things are perfectly smooth or not. Especially for sub-D geometry. All right, so that's rebuilding. Rebuilding things. Very useful when you want to either increase complexity or reduce complexity of your geometry. Then we have extend. Extend is uh, useful, uh, at least for me, only with two-dimensional objects and it works exactly the same way as how it works in um, AutoCAD. Extend, select boundary objects, this little curve right here, enter, and we extend this one and just extends until it reaches this uh, curve right here. Right, that's all it does. You can uh, extend different things. You can extend surfaces onto other surfaces, but again, I usually don't use that. I use just a regular extend for curves. <clears throat> There's also explode. We already talked about explode. Any kind of geometry. Uh, let's do a box. And let's also do a polyline. can be exploded. Now we have six surfaces here. And we have whatever amount of straight line segments here. Um, during cleanup, explode is useful when you need to deal with separate surfaces separately. But usually um, you, you just work with the whole geometry as it's joined up. By the way, speaking of which, joining things up. Right now, these three surfaces are separated, but I can easily select them, all three of them, type in join, and now they are joined into one poly surface. I cannot join these, uh, this surface onto here because they don't touch. So I would actually need to move M, enter, from this point to this point, select them and then join them for them to be joined up. Same thing for the curves. These two curves cannot be joined up, but if I move M enter from here to here, select them, then I can join them up into one poly curve or polyline. 
Okay, so that's explode and join. Then we have uh, fillet and chamfer um, and also fillet corners, I guess. Uh, so in terms of filleting, um, works exactly the same way as what you would expect. Let me quickly draw a few examples here. Like that. Um, fillet. Select first curve to fillet uh, with radius zero. Uh, first curve, select second curve to fillet, click, fillets to a corner. When you already have a corner, it will do nothing if you have radius zero. When things are intersecting, that is still going to work. It's going to fillet. Let me undo. Let's do again, but this time radius 10. First curve, second curve. Enter to repeat the fillet. First curve, second curve. Enter to repeat the fillet. First curve, second curve. Let's. Okay. Now in terms of chamfer. Chamfer. Um, it gives you two distances. Uh, that is basically how far away will the endpoint move from the corner um, to create a chamfer. So here we used 10, right? So I'm just going to hit 10 and hit enter again to give it 10 by 10. So that after it kind of both curves reach a cor corner the point is moved by 10 millimeters away from that corner along both of the curves to create this kind of a diagonal right same thing here same thing here that's a chamfer right so then to <clears throat> fillet corners um let's say you have Something like this, like a lot of corners. You could technically go a, a lot around all of them and fillet them, but you can also just do fillet corners for this poly curve, uh, polyline, and then you just give it fillet radius 10 and it fillets all of them all at the same time, right? It's quite useful, quite nice, because then you can immediately ex extrude this, offset surface this outwards, um, I guess 10 millimeters or something like that and you have yourselves a little wall situation going on that's nice right um, so that's fillet corners tween curves uh, is a very very powerful tool in my opinion um, basically when you have let's say remember lofting right we did this kind of a zigzaggy thing uh, let's make it more aggressive and we had a copy of it, just one, not two, just one copy. And let's make it different. So I'm just gonna move this control point here and let's just say move this control point somewhere here. Maybe this moves out, it becomes bigger, right? Then we can technically loft between these two and get something like this. But what if we want to create a curve that is an average between these two? That is where tween curves comes in. Between curves, select start and end curves. Start curve, end curve. Just creates a bunch of curves in between. Well, 10 to be exact. We don't want 10, we just want one. And this is going to be the exact average of these two curves. Sometimes you get something like this, like a messed up looking curve. That is because your endpoints don't match up. And all you need to do is just click on one of the endpoints to make them match up and then it's gonna be clean again. Hit enter, you get your control point, uh, sorry, con control curve. You can mess around with it a little bit more. Then you tween between these two. Uh, here you go, it's messing up. So you just click on one of the endpoints like that. Mess around with this. Something like that. Twin between these two. Again, messing up. It's perfect. Move that in. And then you, you know, you get... This is the fast, fastest way of how you can create a custom loft really quickly. By just tweening and adjusting the, the, the cross sections. So tween curves, quite useful. 
Um, I already talked about points on. Uh, I will repeat it again. So if you have a curve here and you just select it and if you don't get the control points or if you want to see the control points constantly, you just hit F10 and it will show you the control points of the curve even if you are modeling something else, you know, like a tower situation going on here. Uh, the control points persist. They are still here. So you can kind of move them around and so on. If you don't want to see them anymore, you just hit escape and they are gone. So that's <clears throat> apologies. That's control points. Um, if you select a box and you hit or any poly surface and you hit F10, it only gives you this, uh, these, these points right here. This one. Wait, this is an extrusion point. Apologies. For a box, it should not even give you that. I'm exploding and joining the box. I'll do the same thing for these two guys right here. Explode, join. So these like a prop, like these are the most bare bones uh, NURBS poly surfaces that are enclosed. Now if I hit F10, cannot turn on points for poly surfaces um, because these guys consist of more than one surface, so it doesn't know what you want it to do and which control points to show. So instead, what we type in is we, for this type of poly surfaces, meaning shapes that are made out of more than one surface, we type in solid PT on, solid points on, solid PT on. Hit enter, we get the control points, and now we can select them and mess around with them. It gives you much less control points than what you're used to. It only gives you the corner control points for solids. If you want to get a more gradu granule, um, how do I say this, uh, control over this, then you do need to actually explode the polysurface explode get the surface that you want to work on rebuild f10 or points on to get the control points you know do whatever you want with them and then join everything back and now we're back to the closed poly surface but this time with you know a weird thing going on at the, at the top of it. Hope that makes sense. All right. Um, we still have quite a few tools to go through. Um, let me let me actually think uh, for a second. Um, there is one tool that I really want to show you. So, for instance, um, let's say we are creating some sort of a let's create a surface just any kind of a surface like that and let's rebuild it with uh, 4 by 4 and 3 by 3 degree 3 for co control points and as per usual I'm just doing a dome shape that's the easiest one to show things on like that and let's say I want to have a certain curve projected onto this on the top of this dome shape so i would draw in the top view probably with wireframe drawing mode and let's say i draw a banana a very weird banana but a banana nonetheless right and if i look at it in perspective view the banana is on the floor right that's not great so what i would to, to get it on top of the surface I would need to move the banana above the surface and use project the project tool enter select curves and points or points actually to project so I select my banana enter select surfaces poly surfaces sub these or meshes to project onto well I select my surface and hit enter 
and now the banana is on top of the surface and I can select the banana for instance and I can say not trim let, let's say we split we split the surface enter with the banana enter and now we have two patches here and this patch gets extruded a little bit up um, or rather sorry let's undo not extruded offset offset surface this patch gets offset by 10 units and this one gets offset by 20 units right and if i check both of them with emap that's how it looks like right a little banana emboss and actually two separate pieces so that that's that's the benefit of using project right you can easily project any pattern you want onto any type of geometry uh, project does have a direction that you can describe as well by default it's straight down project to seaplane um, this is quite useful when you have messed up geometry honestly so let's say you draw some sort of a balloon thingy and your balloon thing is all crooked and all messed up but you actually want it to be flat right there are two ways of how to make it flat way number one is project to seaplane project to seaplane you select the object enter uh, it asks you would you like to delete the input yes and it just kind of plop, plops it on the ground becomes flat you can use planner surface it's it, it just works right it's now flat but uh, another way that i've learned actually quite recently is what if you just scale it along the z axis to zero exactly the same thing you know it doesn't get plopped on the ground yes that's true but it becomes flat and you can still use planner surface to create a surface from it so you can either project or just scale things to zero along their height <clears throat> um i'm wondering if there's anything more that i want that i should show you well i guess the last thing is let's say we have this we we know for a fact that this is flat right so if i extrude this down then the top of it is flat and the bottom of it is flat and i already mentioned this in the previous examples but as long as the openings of your shape are flat you can select the shape and type in cap cap to create surfaces uh, on those openings to make the shape enclosed right so that is the cap tool and i think in terms of this kind of um, geometry manipulation methods that's mostly it because everything else is a little bit too niche and should only be you know kind of learned once you actually need to to use uh, to, to use those tools yeah so we skip ahead uh, and we will talk about solid operations such as well, in other words they're called boolean operations but that is going to happen after I had a little bit more coffee. All right, so now let's talk about solid operations or Boolean operations as I like to call them. And the reason why I call them Boolean operations is because every single command or Boolean operation starts with the word Boolean. So we're talking about Boolean union, Boolean difference and Boolean split. These, um, tools or these operations only work with NURBS based geometry um, and they only work with enclosed solid geometry meaning geometry that has no openings uh, for instance a cube can like boolean operations can be applied to this cube because it's closed it has you know an inner volume and outer volume rhino can 
distinguish between what's inside and what's outside of the cube. If you're not sure if your geometry is closed, you can always select it and type in what. When you type in what, the command what, it's going to give you a description of the object. Er, and here, well, here right now it says extrusion surface. That's because uh, a box is technically an extrusion surface. If you can see extrusion surface, you know for a fact that it's enclosed. But if you want to make sure, you can always explode and join. Join it up and then type in what? And now it's going to say that it's not an extrusion surface because we lost that information during the explode join process. But instead it's closed solid poly surface. Closed the keyword here. Um, for example, another one would be a sphere, right? A, a very simple one. So let's just draw a quick little sphere here. Now on to Boolean operations. So Boolean union, let's start with this. Boolean union can merge two objects into one. And it's not like it's joining them. It's actually uh, going to carve uh, into both of the objects and create, you know, that overlapping bit inside of the sphere of the cube and the sphere sphere bit that is inside of the cube those will be removed that that volume will be removed and these two will be merged into one shape so if i select both of them and i type in boolean union now you can see that there is a seam here and if i were to go to ghosted preview it's all merged up into one shape uh, let me undo this so this is now, I just did Ctrl Z. Now we're back to having two shapes. Now the next tool is Boolean Difference. Boolean Difference. Select all surfaces to subtract from. Okay, so that gives us a hint on what we can expect to happen, right? So let's say we're going to be removing from the cube. Enter. Subtract with. With this sphere. Enter. And now you can see that we're using one, one volume to carve another. Very useful, super useful tool. I use it all the time. Both of these are used quite a bit. If you want to, and I'm, I've just ended it so that we can do the third tool, Boolean split. So Boolean, uh, Boolean split is used when you, you want to keep both parts. Right, so with Boolean difference, you're removing one of the parts, but with Boolean split, okay, let's select surfaces or poly surfaces is split, so that's the cube, enter, and we want to split with the sphere, enter. Let's move the sphere out, out of the way, and now we can see that our little cube has a separated out part that was separated by the sphere. Uh, most of the time I don't use this. Um, I'm not sure where it would be helpful, but I'm sure that, you know, if you'll need to, you will remember that there is a third option. Usually you just use Boolean union and Boolean difference. Boolean split might be useful. So then in terms of um, how do you work with mesh based uh, or rather, sorry, sub D based geometry, because we slightly touched on sub D. So let's actually talk about it. Well, let's see here. Um, if I create a quick sub D box right here, and I can kind of mess mess it up, something like this, maybe goes out a bit, you know, just something like that. And then I have another. Um, let's go for sub D box again. Another form like that and maybe the top of it is scaled down and crooked this way and i kind of want to remove from this sub d let's say i want to carve you know use boolean difference uh, with this sub d right so removing from this with this i still can technically do it but remember that is going to be a highly destructive process because first of all if i just do boolean difference now and select the sub d enter with this enter it works it removes but notice how 
the shading changed and the preview of it changed. And now as I select the shape, it doesn't tell me that it's sub D anymore. It tells me one closed poly surface has been selected. So what it basically does when you apply a Boolean operation to a sub D shape, it converts the sub D into a poly surface. And now I've lost the capability of, you know, selecting an edge and cleanly moving it uh, up and retaining the continuity. Now moving an edge actually breaks the continuity and messes my geometry up. Just like that. Right? So now with EMAP, I can clearly see that wherever I moved the edges, they got messed up. And where I haven't moved them, they're still clean. Right? Let me undo the movement, do the EMAP again. All right, so that's that's a little bit of a extra information in in regards to sub D geometry and boolean operations. Now let's talk about um, utility um, tools or, or supplementary tools that you might end up using. Uh, first one would be uh, zoom select all. Um, so for instance, if I have a box here and a box somewhere here third box somewhere here, maybe there's a box right there, and I'm kind of working on, you know, one part, and then I'm working on the second part, but um, let's say I lost, um, or rather, I keep working on this box, you know, and then kind of moving, moving the edges, moving them up, and so on, blah, 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 and I need to quickly look at the whole, um, sorry, uh, the, the, the whole uh, model, the overview of my whole model. So I want to zoom out so that everything fits in my model. I can very easily do this by uh, do, doing this kind of set of shortcuts. Control A, Control A selects everything in the viewport, right? Or if not in even the viewport, in your model, uh, in your file. So Control A, and then I type in Z, S A zoom select all viewports enter and I actually should show this to you you can see that it zoom out, zooms out and kind of focuses on all of these different shapes and if I minimize the viewport you can see that it happens in all of the viewports if you only want to let, let me do it here let's mess it up let's mess it up there we go if you only want to do it in one, a single viewport, then you can still do this by doing Ctrl A, Z, A, or sorry, Z, S, zoom selected, enter. And then it zooms in only in the active viewport that you have, and it, uh, in all other viewports it stays this, the way it was. Easy. Um, this is one of the most used tools, Z, S especially. Um, in, in my kind of modeling process, because I can very easily just select an object, type in ZS, enter, and now my camera is locked to that object. So I'm kind of working on it, you know, I'm messing around with it, blah, 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 and I'm done. And I want to jump to some other part of, you know, of my scene. So let's say this one, I selected ZS, enter, and now I'm rotating about this one. So in doing so, it's very easy to jump around different objects and kind of work on them separately. ZS is your friend. Please use it wisely. Um, then there is another one. Let me delete this. ZS to jump to this. Uh, dupe border or dupe edge. So dupe border is very useful, especially when you have um, open geometry. So for instance, control shift, click one of the faces of my box and I'll hit delete. And now this is considered an open geometry. Well, duh, it has the opening right there. If I need to, if I want to get a curve from here, I can just select my shape and type in dupe border. It's going to give me 
or generate a curve around its opening. When you're dealing with 3D printing things that you want to make sure that everything is closed and it says the geometry is open and you have no idea where, you can always use dupe border and it's going to generate curves around the areas that you need to fill in and fix. Uh, other, and there are of course millions of other reasons why you would use this tool. This is just kind of one of them. Let's say you want to get this edge out this edge right here. Do border will not work, but dupe, duplicate, dupe edge will. Dupe edge, you select the edge that you want to duplicate. Let's go for these three. Enter. Drag them out. Now we have one, two, three edges duplicated. Right? So you can easily extract sub geometry from the main geometry. Same thing applies to dupe surface or extract sorry it's actually extract surface extract srf enter you do want to make sure that copy is set to yes or else it's going to actually remove the surface from the geometry that you want to extract it from so copy yes you select the surface enter move it up and you've ex successfully extracted the surface, meaning that you can, you know, work with it separately to create even more, more geometry. Actually a pretty, pretty nice, pretty nice tool. Don't forget that you can cap. No, you can't. So to fill this in, for instance, to fill in this hole, you would need to use edge surface, edge surface, one, two, three, four edges, fills in, Join it up, join everything up. Now it's closed poly surface, right? Um, move, rotate and scale can be done exactly with the same. Um, like just just like what we're doing with the gumball, you can do this with commands as well. So if I select this shape, I can type in move, enter and I can move it from point to point. So let's say um, I just want to move it from this corner point. Make sure that object snap is turned on and end snap is turned on. So from this corner point, I can move it to, let's say here or here or here, wherever I want to snap it to, right? It just moves there. Uh, copy works exactly the same way as move. I will not show it to you. Um, the command is copy. Right, uh, except that it leaves the original in place. It just makes a copy of it. Then we have um, scale. So scale um, is actually scale. Um, it asks you to give it a base point and then how big, right? So let's say for this object right here, I give it a base point right here. And then it asks me to either give it a first reference point or a factor. If I just give it a number right now, if I'm not clicking anymore, if I'm just typing in, let's say two, enter, two is like twice as big, right? So it just scales two times around that center point. If I give it five, it's five times. If I give it 0 0.1, it's 10% of the original size, right? Um, but notice how there was an alternative way of scaling things. So scale, if I give it a base point right here, uh, and instead of a factor, if I give, if I say my reference point, right, if I click here, now with the mouse, I can specify what kind of dimension I want to have between these two points, right? So a simpler example, let's go for simple. Let's say I have my, my box and I'll just do it whatever size, something like that, right? And I want um, this, this box to be, let's say, one, one hundred millimeters or 10 centimeters between these two points. So I can select this box, type in scale, base point, let's say right here or right here, doesn't really matter, here, second point, here, and then I type in 100. 
And I'm basically saying between these two points, give me a hundred. So I know for a fact that here and here we have a hundred and everything else follows. Okay. What if you don't want everything to follow? What if you want to scale things in only one direction? Well, you're in luck. There's scale one direction or scale one D option. Scale one D, select object, enter from here to here. I want to have 50 millimeters. I type in 50, hit enter, it scales down to 50. Easy as that. Um, in terms of rotate, there are two, well, two useful ways. There are so many in <laughs> different ways, but two useful ways of how you can rotate. If you just want to rotate things in a plan within the uh, C plane, then you just type in rotate, enter, select objects to rotate, this bad boy, enter. What's the center of rotation? Let's say this point right here. And you just specify either an angle or you click once click twice, right? Or you can say from this point, uh, angle 45 degrees, it gets rotated. Easy as that. Uh, very simple to gumball, except with the gumball, you get the center point usually in the middle of the object. Uh, what if your object is like that and you want to rotate around this edge? Well, then you use Rotate 3D. Rotate 3D. Select objects to rotate, this bad boy. And now it asks me to give it a rotation axis. So I said around this, this axis right here, right? So I click once on one end of the axis, click twice on wherever else, whichever point you want along the axis. So let's say whatever here. And then I can either again specify an angle. So I just type it in or I can just click once and then I can still, by the way, specify an angle, I believe. Yeah, I can still do that. Or I click twice. Look, and it's rotated easy as that. Um, what else is, is useful? <clears throat> if you have one, two, three, four. Let's see, four geometries, and they don't need to be the same, right? Four types of geometries, or not types, but four geometry pieces, and you only want to work on one of them, and others are getting in the way. You can always select the geometry and type in isolate. Isolate. When you isolate a piece of geometry, all other ge types of geometry get hidden. They get uh, hidden away. They're still there, they're just hidden. Uh, it's very similar to just taking the geometries and placing them in a separate layer and hiding the layer, right? They're still there, they're just hidden. To show the hidden geometries, if you used isolate, you can always unisolate. Unisolate or you can uh, just type in show and it shows. If you have hidden geometries uh, and you only want to show, you know, not maybe everything, but just bits and pieces from hidden geometries, you can type in show selected and then select the geometry that you want to show. Let's say this one, hit enter and then it kind of gets gets shown to you right so hide show isolate three tools oh i forgot to mention hide right so if you just select a piece of geometry and type in hide it gets hidden isolate is basically an inverse hide if you want to think that way so show let's let's have all of these geometries uh, actually showing um then in terms of selecting things Sometimes you want to group things up, especially if you have, um, let's say I do a wall, right? Uh, 200 millimeters in thickness and uh, three meters in length, uh, four meters in height. And then I create some sort of a really quick window opening. You don't need to follow along this. 
This is just me kind of messing around to, sh to give you an example. So let's say, you know, a, a wall, a, w a window opening right here. Um, and then I just create a, a window frame. Like that. We offset, oops, offset the curve. Uh, I will offset it inwards by, uh, let's go for 50 millimeters. Like that. Create a surface from this. Also take the inner one, create a surface from that. And let's just say the window frame is 100 millimeters in its uh, thickness. And the window itself is like 20 millimeters in thickness. And it's single pane glass and is moved by 30 millimeters out. And the whole package is moved in by minus also 30 millimeters, whatever. Right, so we have something like this. By the way, while I... Well, I'll, I'll talk about that later, sorry. Um, don't want to jump the gun too much. So let's say you have, um, you know, a wall, wall segment and windows. And you're kind of copying it and, and working on each separate portion here. Um, dealing with glass and frames separately might be not convenient. You might want to be able to select the window, uh, both parts of the window at the same time. Uh, so what you can do is you can select uh, both of these pieces of geometry and you can type in group to group it up. You group it up and now it's one group that contains the two pieces that we've had um, while these are still separate. It doesn't join them up they're not joined. They, this is just a selection based thing. It doesn't change the geometry at all. So this is grouped in terms of just ease of selection. Mm, to ungroup it, well, you select the group and you type in ungroup. And now it's ungrouped. For those of you who are familiar with um, Revit, or Archicad, you might think, oh, how do I create families here and so on? And the way you do it is through blocks or block instances. So I will not be covering this part uh, right now because I think it's a little bit too advanced, but basically you can just select one, you know, type of geometry that you have created. In this case, this window, type in block specify what's the base point for the block let's say here give it a name window one okay and now you have this block instance that every time you copy is it's basically for rhino this is the same geometry right it's a block um if i type in block manager i can see that there is like the window block right here it's like a you know family filter and I can oops sorry close um, I can choose to select all of the instances in the scene that are you know that come from window one um, this is like a very quick example of blocks it's ac it actually goes pretty deep um, right so group and group is very different from blocks and it's very different from joining. It's just a selection based thing. I believe that is it with the utilities. I'm trying to think if there are any more main ones that I would like to show you, but there's not. So now we will move forward with actually creating a piece of geometry. Um, and I'll, or a piece of architecture, and I'll explain you, uh, I'll try to explain the process uh, or the thought process behind the creation to you.